Um, this is the meeting for June uh, 4th, and this is to address our four COVID related topics as assigned to us by Management Council. These topics were identified by Management Council as being appropriate for the Joint Judiciary to review. As you can see from our agenda, we're scheduled to go from 8.15 to about two o'clock. We have devoted today and another day uh, later this month um, to deal with our COVID related topics. So at our second meeting um, later here this month, we will probably review bill drafts that might come out of this meeting if the committee so decides. So uh, as indicated earlier, I will be chairing for the first two topics this morning and Co-Chair McCurkbride will be chairing for the last two topics of the day. And with that, we will start with roll call. Senator Anselmi Dalton. Excused. Senator Boner. Here. Senator Cost. Here. Senator Von Flater. Here. Representative Burlingame. Here. <laughs> Representative Gray. Here. Representative Jennings. Here. Representative Pelkey. Here. Representative Ponell. Excused. Representative Salazar. Here. Representative Stiff. Here. Representative Washit. Here. Co-Chairman Kirkbride. Here. Co-Chairman Nethercott. Here. Here. It looks like we have Senator Anselmi Dalton who just arrived as well as Representative Ponell. Present. Representative Ponell, are you present as well? Here. <laughs> Wonderful. Committee, um, just as a reminder, even though we are highly experienced in these Zoom meetings by now, but just um, as we get back into the swing of things this morning and today, for purposes of wanting to speak, um, go ahead and raise your hand on the participant section in, in the Zoom application. Um, when we vote, if we vote, we'll be doing the raise our physical hand vote and holding them up to the screen like that, just as a reminder for some protocol so it's easier to see and understand. Uh, any questions from the committee this morning? It's great to see your faces. We're going to have a productive day. With that, we'll start into our very first topic, which is telehealth for correctional populations. Um, it, you know, again, this is all related to the COVID pandemic, so that's the focus and scope of this of this conversation today. So we'll start with um, the director of the Wyoming Department of Corrections, um, Director Lampert. I think we see him. Mary Beth, do we have him this morning? Yes, uh, Madam Chairwoman, he uh, is admitted into the room. Okay, great, wonderful. So I'm there sure we'll is. see him pop up here shortly. Welcome, Director Lampert. It's good to see you this morning. Good morning, Madam Chairman. Uh, I'm Bob Lampert, Director of the Department of Corrections. It's a pleasure for me to be here this morning. Uh, I believe a few of my staff may be joining. I'm not sure. Um, if not, they'll crowd into my office here. Uh, <laughs> so um, I do want to provide a quick update in regards to uh, what we've been doing uh, for telemedicine within the Department of Corrections. Um, how we've used that service and what we see as a path forward uh, regarding telehealth in Wyoming prisons. We've been using telepsychiatry since 2008. Uh, generally speaking, uh, we have a full-time psychiatrist on staff. So generally speaking, telepsychiatry has been reserved for emergency or follow-up psychiatric services. However, we have the ability to do all medication reviews, intakes and emergency count encounters via telepsych as well. The importance of that tool for us is really evident right now because our psychiatrist is cur currently out on extended leave. So we're relying almost exclusively on telepsychiatry to meet the needs of the patients in his absence. We also have telemedicine capabilities at all five of our prisons. 
and we've been doing those services since 2010. Most telemedicine services have been for non-specialty care services, and that includes things like sick call, chronic care, and health assessments for both mental health and medical. I reviewed the uses of the system for the last four years. In 2017, we used telehealth services 330 times, most often for acute psychiatric and chronic mental health or medical care services. In 2018, we had a physician vacancy, so we had to rely more on other providers from other institutions and the regional me medical director more frequently. So the total usage in 2018 was 1,009. In 2019, it dipped back down to 694. But so far in, in 2020, with only five months on the books, we've used tele services 604 times. That includes 104 acute medical visits, 82 chronic care visits, three acute telepsych visits, 10 telespecialty visits, and 405 chronic telepsych uses. Again, that large number of chronic tel chronic uh, telepsych visits is because our resident psychiatrist is on leave. By using those telemed and telepsych services, we've been able to eliminate bag backlogs and still provide safe and effective care to our inmate population throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. We've continued to push the utilization of specialty telehealth visits. Uh, we see that as one of our key strategies to improve the timeliness of specialty care and also uh, another way to remain fiscally accountable. However, specialty care providers in the community have been somewhat resistant to those efforts uh, because it's just been difficult convincing some of the specialty uh, providers that telemedicine is a safe and effective way to see patients. But one good thing that's come out of COVID, uh, out of the COVID-19 virus is we've seen an increased use of telemedicine and it's more widespread acceptance among the provider community. So as a result, uh, we've began to schedule visits for routine obstetrics, uh, urology, cardiology, and neurology. We also foresee utilizing it in many other fields such as uh, dermatology, for general surgery, for infectious disease, nephrology, and orthopedics. So in short, Madam Chairman, we support an increase in the use of telemedicine services and believe we can gain some efficiency in doing so. But the actual number of billable hours and the cost of medical care will likely not go down, even if the care is delivered remotely. But we can Im impact transport costs and the risks will also go down. Especially providers are still going to bill us for the treatment they provide, although we'll be able to negotiate a little bit and make the argument that we're not no longer disrupting uh, their office by having an inmate in the office or clinic. Uh, we frankly, we've already negotiated with all of the providers to get the best, pos best possible price for offsite care. So I don't anticipate much cost savings there. So most of the cost savings would come by way of reduced transportation costs and staff time. Inmates are frequently sent as far away as 120 miles each way to hospital facilities for doctor's visits, procedures, and follow-up appointments. So that's up to six hours off-site for a, for a single medical transport. Each medical transport requires two staff and a lot of staff time. In addition, it takes inmates outside the secure perimeter of the prison, so it may introduce some level of community risk as well. Expanded use of telemedicine could also make delivery of our contract provided medical services more efficient. Some of our medical providers and regional medical director have to physically tra travel from one prison to another to deliver services. And we think that could be done more efficiently through technology and reduce their travel time and increase their patient contact hours. Unfortunately, we're still utilizing the original polycom units that were provided to us by the Wyoming Telehealth Consortium. Those units are outdated and the peripherals no longer work. Therefore, in order to successfully maximize the use of telemedicine, we have a need for updated wall-mounted telemedicine equipment at all five uh, of our facilities. Well, again, with the associated peripherals for more thorough and accurate healthcare encounters. So, that's an area for possible investment of some stimulus or CARES funding. We've gotten actual, we have not gotten actual bids, but uh, requests for information 
uh, have provided us with a minimum of $95,000. Uh, so we could have a fully integrated telemedicine and telepsychiatric service for all five facilities for 95,000. That, that's the low end. That would include two wall mounted units at our larger institutions and then three mobile units uh, with the necessary peripherals to use at the smaller units. If we upgraded to five wall mounted units and two rapid deployment units, which would be the ideal, that would run 198,000, but it would also give us the most flexibility to maximize the use of telemedicine. So considering how much it costs us to transport inmates to and from medical appointments, that investment would pay for itself within about 600 to 800 additional uses. I noticed Mr. Shannon has, has joined us. Um, so I, I don't know if he has anything to add, but, but if not, we would stand for questions, Madam Chair. Thank you, Director. Mr. Shannon, do you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, Madam Chair, committee members, I'm Dan Shannon, Deputy Director. Uh, Madam Chair, I do not at this time, but I stand for any questions that the committee may have. Wonderful, thank you. Just a reminder to the committee and members of the public, I'm sure with the Department of Corrections here before us right now, you're also interested to know how the pandemic might be uh, facing Department of Corrections. We will be addressing that broader topic later this afternoon, but for right now, we're kind of narrowly focused in on um, any, uh, any support and information we can provide as it relates to telemedicine for our correctional populations. Committee members, questions for the director or the deputy director? Uh, Representative Washett. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Mr. Director, uh, this summer or during the session, we were told that mental health and substance abuse treatment were um, bifurcated, separated, and that they were provided by different contractors. Um, and then I'm looking at the handout material that came with our uh, presentation today, and it seemed to indicate that on that first pie chart that both substance abuse and mental health were um, together. Can, when we use telemedicine, are we combining substance abuse and psychiatric or am I missing something here? Madam Chairman, Representative Warshit, uh, they are separate contracts. Um, we have separate treatment providers. This, the same treatment provider provides all mental health and medical services, dental, uh, et cetera. Uh, and that contract is currently under negotiation uh, at this time. Uh, the, the substance abuse contract is separate. Uh, they do not use the telemedicine uh, services. Uh, those are reserved for our type, uh, psych and, and mental health services at this time. However, we do have capability to, to put uh, assessors and counselors in contact with those in substance abuse treatment if needed through our regular administrative uh, connections. Any follow-up, Representative Washett? No? Uh, Representative Gray. Thank you, Madam Chairman. So I've got a couple different questions. One is uh, on the transport costs. So is that currently, are you folding that through section 231 in state, in state travel, your transportation costs for medical visits or is that coming out of uh, some other series? Madam Chair, Representative Gray, that's covered in our operational expenses um, for each institution. So there's not a, separ not a separate billing for uh, travel uh, there is an exception, and that is if we're, we're going out of state where the uh, staff have to stay in a hotel um, because of the location of the hospital. Uh, in that case, that's billed to the institution's travel uh, budget for that individual uh, staff member that's staying in the hotel. Otherwise, it's absorbed in operational costs. Follow up, Representative? Thank you, Madam Chairman. So what is your, uh, do you have a, a feeling on the estimate of the size of the, the reduction for at least the upcoming biennium? Madam Chairman, Representative Gray, uh, I do not. I, I can tell you that, you know, the, the longer transports, um, we average probably about $350 in just 
operational costs uh, for staff time, in, um, vehicle, gas, those kind of things. Uh, so for every televisit that we are able to use, that's a $350 savings. And as I indicated, you know, if we could, if we could re increase our televisits by 800 over the course of the year, the any investment in, in updated telemedicine equipment would be paid for by itself. Now, so I guess part of the question is, um, you know, if we had to, um, well, we couldn't do that with the existing equipment, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So it would take some investment, but then investment would eventually pay for itself and fairly quickly so given the cost of transport. There's also the community factor uh, in regards to any time we take somebody outside of our secure perimeter, there's a little bit of an enhanced community risk to that. Although we're sending two staff and, and one of them's armed, it's still, um, you know, it's still not quite as secure as keeping them inside of our own facility. Representative Gray, any follow-up? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Yeah, so what has been the communication with the governor's office about the I guess it's a $95,000 investment. Excuse me, I, we just don't have any of this written, I don't think, so I've been writing it all down. I, I think you said $95,000. So, I mean, uh, in, that, in that bill, he has the authority to, to disperse those funds uh, under that cap. What has been the communication on that? At this point, uh, represent, uh, Madam Chairman, at this point, Representative Gray, we have not formally submitted a uh, CARES or COVID-19 stimulus uh, funding request for telehealth. I was waiting for this particular uh, discussion to see what the what the support might be for that investment. Anything further, Representative? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chairman. So I want to understand a little more. Excuse me, I was a lot of info and good info. Without this equipment, what are the constraints right now? I mean, are are there certain facilities where in situations you cannot have telehealth without the equipment and how many cases, I mean, I understand the pay for, you're saying 600 uses. Um, what are the constraints right now without that equipment? Madam Chairman, Representative Gray, again, the existing system, um, the old polycom system is outdated in the peripherals, the things that allow for specialty visits like, uh, you know, the, the eye, I don't know, I don't remember all the details, but the, the things that would allow an opt optician, for example, to examine the eyes, uh, the heartbeat monitors, the other things that, that we could use for specialty care no longer work with the system. An updated system would allow for all that specialty care, which is where we, where we see the savings because our offsite transports are generally speaking, either emergent or specialty care. So we wouldn't be able to eliminate the emergent cases the ones that require hospitalization, but certainly for things like general surgery, where uh, there could be, it can be done remotely with, with a provider on site, uh, working in conjunction with the general surgeon off site, those kind of situations could save us those transport costs. Uh, so that's where we see the savings, but in order to utilize those services and enhance those services, we have to have that updated equipment and the peripheral uh, equipment necessary to do that. Representative, you want me to come back around to you? And we yeah, can thank you, questions? Madam Chairman. Yeah, why don't we come back around? There? Great. Uh, your line of questioning, I think, is very helpful for the committee. Um, we'll go to Co-Chairman Kirk Brighton and Senator Von Flatern, who's had his hand up for a bit, but Co-Chairman. Thank you, Madam Co-Chairman. Director Lampert, it sounds to me as if there's a big upside to, to the use of the telemedicine uh, in the department's work. So would you foresee that once the COVID crisis is over and assuming you got some better equipment that you would continue down this path and maybe even expand the use of it and that there's a really a good of a lot of good opportunity here. Um, Mr. Co-Chair and Chairman Nethercott, yes, the our current uh, medical contractor is the successful bidder on the new contract as well. We're currently engaged in negotiation for price, but they are committed to expanding uh, telehealth, they, they agree that that's the, the best method of enhancing or 
expediting specialty care, uh, getting patients to the specialty care more quickly, thus reducing costs overall for this. You know, if you don't, if you can't, if you can deliver it more quickly, then chances are that the condition will stabilize more quickly and costs of medical services will reduce, but also those transport costs. So our current provider uh, is fully supportive of expanding uh, telehealth, assuming that we have the equipment to do that. All right, Senator Von Floyder. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> so Director Lambert, what was the, the cost for five wall mounted? That was the new cost that you were talking about. Madam Chairman, uh, Senator Von Flatter, the total cost for the, if we had a wall mounted unit at each of our facilities, in other words, it would go in, in the trauma room or treatment room uh, to provide the, the highest quality service at each institution, plus to have two mobile units, the suitcase units that are less expensive uh, to respond to you know, more emergent situations. Uh, that total cost is estimated at 198,000. Again, that would be the ideal, but certainly the $95,000, two units at the larger institutions and, and one mobile unit for each of the smaller institutions would serve the purpose. It just wouldn't be uh, quite as uh, responsive. Representative Gray, are you ready? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Okay, so just want to understand the numbers too of where we're at. So last year, what was the total telehealth uses, uh, the, the number, and then you said through through five months, how many we're at now? Okay, in uh, calendar year 2019, we had 694. So far this year, year five months into the year, we've used it, uh, 604 times. So 694 last year, 604 so far this year. And in 2018, when we were down a physician and had to share a physician remotely between institutions, that was 1,009. Madam Chairman, can I? Representative, yeah, you can just go with a line of questioning here. Thank you, Madam Chairman. So if you're averaging 350 uh, per per visit, a savings of $350 in transport costs, you know, it looks like you're going to about double the, the 2019 amount. So that means that if you keep up that rate, which if, if based on this, if we make the investment in the, in the, uh, in the, the, make the investment you talked about, it should actually go up. I mean, just based on the current rate you're on, that's a savings of, of $200,000 this year. Would you agree with that? Director? Um, Madam Chairman, Representative Gray, I want to emphasize that the 350 is the long term, the 120 mile uh, level of, of cost. So that, that's for the staff time, vehicle, et cetera, to take that person from, say, uh, lust to, to, you know, 120 miles to provide that service. So, um, most of our, we try to use local services when we can, which still takes the person out of the facility and still incorporates staff time. Um, and maybe we can do two or three, uh, especially visits in that way uh, in a day. But the, the single, uh, most costly is the, is the long distance transports usually for uh, uh, ortho, orthopedic uh, kind of visits. Um, where they have to go to a specialty clinic. So those are the higher costs. So I, I would say, and I would ask Dan if he has any thoughts in regards to the average cost, but I would say the average cost is of each uh, transport is probably closer to uh, 100 to 150, but the high end is 350. Deputy Director. Madam Chair, Representative Gray. Uh, it it is closer to, on average, it is closer to 150 per trip. It would take us approximately 11 months to recuperate the cost for this investment. And, and 
in reference to your question, uh, as far as the governor's office being notified, director and I spoke with the governor's office yesterday and advised them we would update them upon uh, our meeting today. Representative Gray. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'm, I'm done. Thank you. All right. Senator Von Flater, is your hand raised again? No. Any additional questions from the committee? Uh, Representative Jennings. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Director, thanks for being here this morning and um, all you, you brought. I have kind of a question to dovetail on to Representative Gray's, but uh, if we, and I know, I'm sure you have this analysis because you track all of this. So first of all, do we know how much of this telehealth that we're going to try and up? Um, is it going to, are we going to get to a point where we are uh, addressing 50% or 75%? I mean, I can't imagine that we're going to, we can't possibly get to 100%. Um, but if the savings are 50% over instead of doing them in person, could we get some figures on that as to what that might look like compared to last year or two um, kind of dovetailing or, or maybe if it only hits 25% increase, um, if we could kind of see a range in between there between the high and the low of what we might see in savings off of that. Could you, could you send that to us director? Madam Chairman, Representative Jennings, I just want to uh, provide the caveat or caveat that uh, this is also dependent upon us continuing to successfully get the specialty clinics to provide uh, the service through telemedicine. There, as I pointed out, there has been uh, a fairly significant, uh, I guess, uh, hesitancy on their part to do that, and it. And it could be because of the nature of their business. I'm not sure, but we've had some inroads in the areas that I talked about uh, in regards to things like uh, nephrology and, and uh, OBGYN kind of stuff. We've had some of those providers uh, during the COVID crisis uh, begin to accept televisits or tele telemedical uh, visits, but we still had some uh, of the other specialties, um, which include things like orthotics uh, that are still resistant. We, we continue to try to work on them, uh, and hopefully we will be able to. Um, once, our, once our contract negotiations with our current vendor are completed and there's a contract in place, we will work closely with them to again try to negotiate uh, the best rates possible and the, the most widespread use of telemedicine that we can. Uh, but we have to take it one step at a time. And, and so that's what makes it hard to, to give a valid prediction in terms of what, uh, what level we will be able to see in savings. But, but we've already seen an increased acceptance in obstetrics, neurology, cardiology, and neurology. So if we can get the other specialties uh, engaged as well, then the potential is, is fairly large. Uh, I would ask Mr. Shannon if he has anything to add. I, I hate to sound like I'm dancing around the issue, but it's, it's just difficult to come up with numbers at this point. Deputy Director. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Jennings, uh, at this time, we may be able to provide you to cost savings of what was effective during 2019 year. Uh, but I'd have to agree with the director with the changes in COVID, we may be able to produce some more services, but this time it would be difficult to predict for 2020, especially if once the COVID uh, pandemic crisis changes. Representative Jennings, follow up. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, so director and, and uh, assistant. Um, so can you split those out? Can you tell us what you're, what you're able to do with um, with telehealth currently and what you're anticipating. It sounds like you might also have a problem for, for getting uh, supply there. Maybe we'll have some other testimony to tell us why, why there's a problem. If, 
if we're making this push towards telehealth, then um, if the capabilities are not going to be there, anyway, I guess back to my first part of that question is, can you split that out? I mean, I, I can't imagine so far we don't probably have a robot that'll do the heart surgery, but um, maybe you could split out some of those and give us cost savings to, to what, what can be done and what is hopeful to be done or, or if you can't come up with a supplier for it. Madam Thank Chairman, you. Representative Jennings, uh, again, typically what we have been doing is uh, in the past was telemedicine, telepsych for mostly in, inside services so that one physician at one institution could support a service at another institution or our psychiatrist could hook up uh, with inmates at any location. Uh, through telepsych and provide that service in, in house. On the em emergency kind of stuff, occasionally we used offsite. Um, but because of, during COVID, we expanded that to some specialty uses. Uh, the ones I mentioned OBGYN, urology, cardiology, and neurology, uh, with vendors who were willing to, or providers who were willing to provide that service remotely. Again, we have not been successful at this point in in the areas of dermatology, general surgery, infectious disease, nephrology, and orthopedics. But we, we think that because of the changing mood in the provider community uh, around the use of telemedicine that we may be able to expand that as well. So we can give you the cost savings in-house that where we didn't have to put a physician in a vehicle or transport an inmate uh, to the physician. Uh, we can also project the cost savings of those visits that have increased around those specialty areas that I mentioned. Uh, what's going to be more difficult is predict, predicting what expansion into the areas that have been hesitant uh, will, will be or, or might be. So we, we can provide a breakout on those th three populations. Deputy Director, did you have anything to add? Madam Chair, I did not. Thank you. Representative Jennings, anything further? Okay, uh, Representative Washett. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Director Lampert, if those specialty areas that are resistant um, don't want to follow through with telemedicine, are you as a department open to looking at other providers around the state? It would seem that uh, telemedicine would allow us to access a wide variety of uh, providers in different locales. Madam Chairman, Representative Warshit, I, I can assure you that we're always willing to look at the, the provider that is the most economical, even if it's not in the same community and, and frankly, even if it's out of state. But we do have some, you know, some, we have to live in the communities as well. And when we can use local services, we try to use local services and we'll continue to do that. Um, but certainly uh, as the budget tightens, um, you know, it becomes more imperative the cost uh, to drive those decisions uh, than it may have in the past. So uh, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is we do have some additional uh, leverage in regards to especially providers that we're, we're currently use, using if they're not willing to go to, to uh, tell us services uh, and we're able to find another uh, provider of equal quality that uh, or equal or better quality that can do it for the same or less, uh, we will certainly do so. Thank you. Senator, <clears throat> Senator Anselmi Dalton. Excuse me. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Director Lambert, thank you for your testimony. I, this is a little bit off topic, but I think it's important for the committee to hear a little bit about um, Medicaid expansion. When I went up to Montana to that, um, prison forum and what they were doing up there, they said that they uh, got a lot of money for Medicaid because the prison population is eligible for Medicaid if they were treated outside jail in a medical institution for more than 24 hours. Um, and then after they're released, if they get them set up with Medicaid, in Colorado, for example, 80 to 90% of the prison population are likely eligible for Medicaid because they're poor. Um, you know, But they can't have it in general unless they have children but they've protected these people. What percent of our prison population do you think um, 
I don't know how often you use a medical institution for more than 24 hours, number one, and how often, what percent of our population do you think would be um, eligible for Medicaid after they left the prison? And therefore giving them, you know, a lot of them have substance abuse, tuberculosis, they have uh, those kind of diseases. And that's why I was just trying to find out kind of what you thought about that. Madam Chairman, Director. Uh, Senator, Currently in Wyoming, because we're not a Medicare expansion state, we, uh, who is eligible for uh, Medicaid is, is limited. First of all, they have to be already registered uh, uh, prior to incarceration and put on an inactive status versus, or suspended versus, uh, I guess, taken off the rolls. Uh, so they have to have a, have already been registered they have to be in a hospital setting for more than 24 hours, as you mentioned, and it's limited to certain categories of, of individuals, such as pregnant females. Uh, and I, off the top of my head, I don't remember all the categories, but there's only a, a couple of categories. Uh, we've looked in the past at, at um, the feasibility of, of uh, trying to get inmates who were not on Medicaid at the time of incarceration, get them enrolled, uh, and then go back in time and, because uh, there's a look back on that. But even doing that, we were we came to the conclusion with our vendor that that the cost of implementing that would be greater than what we would realize in actual payback. So, but what we have done is work with the Department of Health so that any inmates who come to our system now who are already in Medicaid. Uh, or Medicare are put on a suspension status instead of being removed from the role. And then if they subsequently were to be hospitalized, we would work with the Department of Health to reinstate them after that 24 hour period and be able to bill Medicaid for that uh, time frame that they're in, in the hospital. So- Mr. Director? <clears throat> Senator? <clears throat> hey, Director, my question is if we were to say, let's take up Medicaid expansion. The question is a lot of states have done so and saved a lot of money. I know that the argument is that we have to pay 10% of the costs versus, but we're already paying 90 to fund the county, 90% to the fund the county hospitals and things. Um, so I, you know, what I see is the state is stepping over 90% of the funding to not pay 10% of the funding. And I'm wondering if we did Medicaid expansion, what percentage of your people in prison would be eligible in Colorado, it's 80 to 90 percent of the prison population. Madam Chairman, uh, Senator, again, uh, well, asked that way, I would say that the majority of our population, probably uh, 70 percent would qualify uh, in, in an expansion state because of limited income uh, or age or other um, medical condition. Uh, I think probably 70 percent or so would qualify. Uh, for Medicaid in an expansion state. All right, thank you, Director. With that, we have uh, four other people to speak. Um, we've gone through about 40 minutes of testimony with the Department of Corrections. Stay close, Director, as you always do. You know the drill here with these committee meetings, but I think it's important that we hear from the courts and our county jails as well during the next hour we've devoted to this topic. Um, so with that, uh, Director, Deputy Director, thank you so much. Again, don't, don't end the meeting for us quite yet. I, I think we'll probably come back around to you here at, at the end of our topic. Um, but we will now switch to um, Judge Brian Christensen from um, the 7th District Circuit Court out of Natrona County to speak with us about telehealth for the correctional populations and telehealth uh, or tele... Um, technology as it relates to the courts and what um, Judge Christensen sees. So with that, I see you, Judge Christensen. Good morning. Welcome to the committee. Um, please introduce yourself for the audience who is watching us live, and uh, we're happy to see you this morning. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, uh, Chairman Kirkbride, Senators and Representatives of Joint Judiciary. Uh, my name is Brian Christensen. I'm a Circuit Court Judge in Natrona County and President of the uh, Circuit Court Judges Conference. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to discuss how to uh, how this how to enhance court operations with COVID funds for consumer and general public use. I think is 
but I kind of geared my conversation today and testimony. I'll jump right in with the uh, use of hubs uh, with our connection with video conferencing with county jails. Uh, though we may not be on the same system, we are able to video communicate with our local jails and hold hearings, uh, not only for initial appearances, which we, a lot of our courts have been doing prior to uh, the COVID issues, um, but also now uh, preliminary hearing, change of police, civil hearings when an inmate may have a, a a civil hearing such as a protection order, as well as revocation or probations about any hearing where an inmate uh, may be uh, served or required to attend can be done with uh, video conferencing. Uh, obviously, since we're not on the same systems, uh, the uh, contact with uh, the jails is um, different uh, with different jails. Um, here in Latrona County, we have uh, another benefit that's come from this COVID uh, um, pandemic that we are able to handle hearings from other jails around the state. Uh, just this week, we have had hearings uh, with inmates from Campbell County, Converse and Hot Springs counties. Uh, they range from very good in reception to problems with uh, freezing screens, audio problems, bandwidth or connectivity, distorted viewing to paused audios, some of those issues may be as uh, simple as upgrading microphones and speakers at the jail. Uh, others may have to do with uh, increasing bandwidth and connectivity. The um, attorneys in these hearings are, if they have an attorney, are able to appear as well uh, on video conferencing as well. Um, accommodations for attorney client private communications can be made with our platforms, uh, breakouts for them so they can uh, the system may be muted or simply stop recording and everyone leave a courtroom or however it's handled, but the attorney and their client uh, do have the ability for uh, private conversations. May also include, uh, I talked to a judge yesterday, they're using a white, a white noise system. Here, hearings uh, through the judiciary are uh, conducted with Teams platform, but uh, we are also using teleconferencing and Zoom meetings. I hold a virtual drug court through Zoom every Tuesday afternoon. Uh, pleasantly surprised that all of the clients have been able to join by video, either by iPhone, laptop, or iPad, and only a couple of connectivity problems um, that uh, have arisen. Uh, civil hearings, same uh, protection orders and FEDs because they have uh, specific timelines. Uh, those are quick settings that uh, we do serve and and, to, and uh, request our respondents to call in, but for uh, can understand some of them don't read the whole document that they're served. So a lot of them show up to court. Uh, courts handle this different um, from a respondent to allowed to attend in person. If there are social distancing mechanisms already in place for that court, they may be allowed to call in from the parking lot. Uh, courthouses that are closed uh, did check out equipment for uh, the respondents to uh, use in either another room or to uh, use from the parking lot. Um, good percentage of the courts uh, um, don't know uh, on these protection orders or, or a good percentage of the individuals were not aware if an individual is served. So we don't have information of how to contact them, an email address or a phone number. Sometimes we have phone numbers in our system, but as you can imagine, when you get a call from a circuit court, it's not always answered. Um, upcoming, upcoming concerns is related to this social distancing issue. Of course, our jury trials and uh, we've pushed off traffic offenses for uh, asked our uh, law enforcement agencies, the highway patrol and local agencies to set these out a little longer, up to 60 days. And those are gonna be hitting here pretty soon in June. So the question will be efficiency of those proceedings with regard to social distancing, taking into account the care, physical and mental well-being, and safety of those uh, participants, as well as parties and observers and potential jurors in the jury trial issues, as well as, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, better equipment for jails and, uh, um, I haven't had a hearing for a while from Department of Corrections, but I think we could do that from 
uh, the Department of Corrections facilities as well. Another issue that's going to come up with uh, social distancing that we have to consider is use of, of interpreters. Uh, there uh, is becoming um, those cases are starting to become backlogged a little more and coming to the forefront of how we're going to be able to handle that with technology for headphones and those kind of things. And I think I gave you a blast of the information I have and, and uh, Madam Chairwoman, and if there are any questions, I'd be glad to handle. Thank you, Judge Christensen. Great to have you here this morning. Do you know approximately how long you have been um, having inmates from the jail appear in front of the court via video? Madam Chairwoman, uh, uh, several courts around the state had been doing this well ahead, uh, you know, years for years they had been doing them. We just started to do it when the uh, issues hit in oh, early March. Um, and then there was a big push to get, make sure all the courtrooms in, in Wyoming did have the hub capability to do those initial appearances with their local jails. Um, I believe all the courtrooms now have a uh, hub access. Um, we had one here, we now have three for all three judges to be able to use and some are used uh, at uh, the same time with, uh, I may have a hearing with uh, Converse County while we're doing initial appearances up at the jail or preliminary hearing. Oh, Chairman, I think you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Any questions from the committee? I don't see any hands raised. I guess a, just a very direct question to you, um, Judge, do you do the courts need anything as it relates to technology associated with inmate appearances or any, any other technology to allow for more flexibility associated with keeping the courts accessible and open in light of a pandemic? Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Yes, uh, we, are, we had a technology meeting yesterday and uh, I think there'll be a presentation um, at some point on what technology would help to assist us to uh, become better efficient in handling issues concerning the social distancing and, and uh, how to uh, uh, access your local court without uh, putting yourself or others at risk. Um, and that does include uh, uh, potential of more hubs, uh, iPads, um, computers, uh, but uh, Julie Gowen, I think, is going to be with Ms. Sharp here in a little bit and can answer that a little full, more fully with the uh, recommendations that came out of our technology committee meeting yesterday. And, and just one, oh, it looks like we have some questions. Representative Washett. Thank you, Madam Chair. Judge Christensen, good morning. Glad you're with us today. Um, how about physical changes? I remember at our last meeting, you made some comments about uh, jury rooms not being of adequate size and such and so forth. Uh, that seems to me to be a, a, a potentially very expensive uh, solution. Uh, comments there outside of the technology realm? Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, uh, Representative Washett. Yeah, that, that is, uh, we have the courts are doing two plans uh, for operations, one to expand operations generally and one specifically for jury trials. Uh, the jury trials for district courts and 12 person jurors is uh, a lot more significant than it is for circuit courts as they have um, their court was built for a 12 person jury trial. Circuit courts, if they can, you know, if they just have a standalone facility that's just set up for six persons, will have the same issues. But we do have uh, availability of conference rooms and other, and potentially the district court jury rooms where we can outline where jurors could sit for deliberations uh, with the uh, appropriate social distancing. Um, district courts are looking at that. They may have to use uh, um, connected um, other courts for the jury room deliberations. Uh, those are part of the discussions that are going on. How is this going to be handled? but uh, they're all trying to uh, come up with plans signed off on by the uh, public health official, their local public health official that uh, would approve those plans for uh, the appropriate um, 
distancing between jurors as well. And the big one is going to be in jury selection as the judiciary is looking at uh, potentially Zoom jury selections, um, uh, doing them in, in uh, sections or waves, if you will. If you have 40 jurors, are you able to bring in 15 at a time or 20 at a time? Uh, and though uh, there is some drawback to that with uh, defense counsels out there as you're asking a whole panel and the whole panel doesn't get to respond to that question and that uh, uh, type of information that's being shared by the jurors, you have two separate ones going on. So you didn't get the, the full effect of having all the jurors, potential jurors there to answer or uh, capable to respond to those inquiries. So yeah, that's all being looked at uh, right now. Um, for instance, uh, some courts uh, do not have the uh, uh, ability to do that social distancing and they're working with their county officials in uh, relocating or looking at other facilities in which to hold a jury trial. Uh, Carbon County being one, of course, a uh, very small courtroom where there's uh, no way in that little circuit courtroom they could handle a, a jury trial, even a six person jury trial. Uh, Representative Burlingame. Madam Chairman, um, thanks, Judge Christensen. I have two questions, and I think they're they're related. The first question is: If you've heard from any attorneys that their ability to represent their clients has been um, affected or compromised by moving, you know, to to our online system, um, and then the second one, touching on what you just said about jury selection, what does that look like? Is that from our homes? or do the potential jury members go to a courthouse and do they you know, zoom in there? I'm, I'm just thinking of like some equity issues. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, oh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman and uh, Representative Burlingame. Uh, as to uh, um, our representative uh, um, uh, individuals represented by uh, defense counsel, uh, if there has been an issue uh, the court and the defense work that out. Um, if we need to have an in-person uh, preliminary hearing, uh, for example, that is a right, a fundamental right. So uh, we do work that out with social distancing um, being taken into account, or they may be able to put them both in a place together uh, and courts have required that to be done. I've not heard of any, and I've talked to several judges, especially recently, We've not heard anything at this point about um, uh, not being able to uh, represent their client in an effective and uh, uh, required manner uh, before a court hearing. Uh, I think uh, the courts are very sensitive to that and will accommodate any of those issues that come before them. As to jury selection, though, that's all out on the table. It could be anything, but um, those are the issues. If you do a Zoom meeting, as you know, uh, there could be distractions. There could be dogs barking or they have children at home and so are they getting their full attention or would you have them in a, in a, a larger conference area where they could see on iPads or I, on laptops or even their phones and participate that way um, if needed to uh, that type of facility to conduct a jury trial. I know some of our courts are looking at that Zoom uh, jury selection. I know there's a lot of national information on that that's going around, but uh, for most courts, they're planning on holding uh, in-person uh, inquiries and voir dire and not uh, the Zoom, but you might see some of that in, in Wyoming if approved by the Supreme Court. Uh, thank you, Judge. Any final questions before we move on to Mr. Odekoven? All right, seeing none. Judge Christensen, thanks for being here this morning. Oh, Representative Jennings looks like has a question. Thank you, Madam Chairman, Judge Christensen. I, um, this is uh, kind of interesting to me. I mean, I just I just was thinking about that as you were speaking about that for the Supreme Court to put down rules. It, it, there's all kinds of problems. This is a horrible format that we're doing today. It it, uh, it keeps the public out of it in a way that just shouldn't happen. So are you not seeing that there's, are you saying that, that you think that the courts could go to 
jury by Zoom. I, I mean, doesn't it look to me like it just that looks like a horrible idea? Could you expand just a little bit more on uh, what maybe the courts are thinking about there? Thank you. Judge Christensen, horrible idea. Would you like to comment? Yeah, I'm have Gerald. Representative Jennings, uh, it would not be our first choice, Representative Jennings. Um, and it's, uh, I think that would not be uh, something that's uh, taken lightly. And uh, there are, as you've noted, all kinds of problems with it. Um, just a couple of the things I mentioned with the distractions, how do you work those things out? Um, but uh, say you were in a large conference room, uh, maybe everybody is in that conference room, but they still have an iPad in front of them. They're able to communicate or raise their hand or whatever to respond back with the appropriate distancing if you do have um, a large amount of potential jurors. I don't see that being an issue for the circuit courts. I know that, uh, um, but I, I guess I will back up on that. There is a circuit court judge talking about that, um, looking into that if, if uh, needed. But uh, no, it's, I, I agree with you. There's all kinds of problems with it that would have to be worked out. And uh, it would definitely not be first, second, third choice. It would be choice of last resort. Further commentary, Representative Jennings. Yeah, Madam Chairman, thank you. Well, Judge, the, the one that I didn't hear there was the idea of, of jury tampering. It looks to me like you'd open the door to some real problems there, that that you could have uh, anybody have input from the, from the side. Madam Chairwoman, uh, Representative Jennings, uh, that all, all potential issues would be discussed. All right, looks like we have Representative Pelkey. Representative Pelkey, if you can speak up, we can't hear you very well. All right, is that better? Um, I, just to clarify, we're only talking about one year, aren't we? Representative Pelkey um, asked for clarification that we're really only talking about one year. I think he's limited in scope to concerns related just to the COVID-19 pandemic. Judge Christensen, any comments about the limitation in scope to any changes that might be underway? Uh, Madam Chairwoman, Representative Belke, um, I don't think we have a set time limit on that. Uh, it would exact, uh, probably exist as long as uh, COVID possibility of um, uh, catching the uh, disease or issue um, still arises. Uh, that's potential. Um, but yeah, we would hope this would go away and we could get back to operating as normal. <clears throat> it wouldn't be a new norm if you would, if that's uh, what Representative Pelkey was talking about. Looks like we have another question from Representative Burlingame. Is that right? Nope, nope, okay. With that, Judge Christensen, thank you so very much for your time here this morning. We're gonna go ahead and switch to Mr. Odekoven, representing the Sheriffs and Chiefs. Mr. Odekoven, I see you're on. We'll wait to see your face here. And good morning, remember to introduce yourself to the committee and share with us what you um, have learned about the teletechnology um, with our county jails and working with the courts and transports and all, all of those issues, if you could, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Byron Odekoven, representing the Wyoming Association of Sheriffs and Chiefs of Police. I appreciate the fact that the Department of Corrections and Judge Christensen spoke before me, kind of outlining many of the basic issues that we'll kind of talk about uh, in telehealth, telemedicine, and video court arraignments from our perspective. So let me start with the telehealth telemedicine and, and kind of fill in a couple of the thoughts on from the county jail perspective. So generally speaking on the jail side, we have not um, utilized much of telemedicine telehealth because a lot of our issues are that, that first appearance, if you will, that first inclination when we get someone in jail uh, it's, it's surprising to know, to learn that many of them don't know the extent of their symptoms or issues because now they're um, not able to self-medicate in some fashion, uh, whether it's through drugs or um, alcohol. 
And so we kind of get them up and get them going with our inmate medical staff and determine that they need to see a doctor. And then much as the director uh, described, we transport them to the doctor's office after the nurse uh, suggests that that's the thing to do. So many of the jails have on staff nursing, but do not have on staff doctors per se, or the doctor may come in a couple of days a week. So the, the transport issue that the director described is very real in the jail setting as well. Uh, and there's significant savings if we could uh, figure out how to be able to conduct that telemedicine, telehealth uh, delivery of service to the inmate. Many of the problems described both in terms of equipment within the jail, but what was not described was equipment within the doctor's office because it takes that corresponding monitor, camera, microphone, and maybe even some specialty equipment that on, on if you can believe everything you see on television or read on in some of the publications of the ability to do EKGs by putting two fingers on your iPhone, that's, that's beginning to be pretty uh, amazing at some of the things that they're able to do that the doctor may be able to receive some of those kinds of medical reports and make some preliminary diagnosis. The compounding issue, of course, is the doctor has to have the ability to be able to do that and then the desire to be able to see a patient remotely uh, for the telemedicine. Um, and that uh, not everyone is ready to embrace that hands-off approach to that initial assessment kind of, a, kind of a discussion. Having said that, we have a couple of jails in Wyoming uh, who do have a contract for delivery of the total medical system. So it involves the on-site nurse a doctor that comes in, and then as the director kind of described, that specialty of being able to engage an additional doctor uh, through a telehealth contract for the delivery of service within the jail. And it's reported those are going pretty well. Uh, but again, that's a specialty uh, set up doctor, doctor's office, and the ability to do that uh, medical call or receive that medical call and deliver that service back to the uh, detention facility. So that is not uh, happening as much as we would like. Um, again, for many of the ways that the director described the safety involved with transporting the folks, the timeliness of delivery of that medical service, and of course the ability for the doctor to be able to um, see that patient, rely on what he's seeing and trust the liability issues, if you will, of, of not catching everything because they aren't right there in front of them. So there's several little pieces of that that will need to be kind of worked out. And the biggest one that I think that your, the committee's kind of focusing on is that delivery of the equipment, the cost of the equipment, both within the detention facility and within the doctor's office, frankly, um, to be able to deliver that. And with that, I think I'll pause on telemedicine, telehealth for a second before I switch in over to video and video court. Sounds like you've done this before, Mr. Odekoven. Any questions from the committee? Mr. Odekoven, when there is a, an, an inmate um, in the county jail, who pays for medical services that they might need? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it's generally accepted that when you present to the jail uh, and you present with medical issues, the burden is on you. Um, you, you come with that uh, issue and problem, you go to the doctor of your choice, um, provided they'll see you. And if, if, one, if you don't have a doctor, we'll provide one, so to speak. So the inmate or the detention, because you're innocent until you're proven guilty. So these are innocent folks, if you will, within the detention center setting, seeing the doctor of their choice for the issue that they have. So it's their cost burden. Many of the counties or most of the counties have a system worked out where they don't leave the doctor in the lurch, if you will, uh, because many of these folks are indigent. Um, so the um, doctor works out a rate with the uh, county to provide that service, usually at, at some form of a reduced rate and the county uh, reimburses the doctor's office, and then they together go forth and seek reimbursement 
whether it comes out of their commissary account, whether it comes with a judgment, whether it comes for the court, uh, where the judge says what, what costs have you incurred in jail that they're then liable for and work out back to the county for that delivery of the service. All right, thank you, Mr. Odekoven. Um, seeing no questions from the committee, please proceed with your presentation. Thank you. Let me touch on one point that was that was brought up in terms of the uh, Medicare and Medicaid uh, as it relates to corrections and, and that billing as well. And there is a, a two bills before Congress now uh, to expand uh, the delivery of Medicare and Medicaid to uh, the corrections as well as detention settings. It's generally accepted that when you come through the door and the door shuts behind you, the benefit that you would have received stops. Um, and so there is a push uh, nationally, or there was, I think there'll be lots of other issues brought up before this comes back up, uh, to recognize that that Medicare and Medicaid eligibility should continue when they just come to a facility in one form or another. Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Odekoven, really helpful information there. Anything further from you, Mr. Odekoven? Oh, yes, please. Let me do the uh, video. Video. So thank you. Uh, so starting the video court uh, discussion or video arraignments, uh, the um, counties and detention facilities have attempted for years to be able to do more of that initial onesies brief hearing in front of the judge in some form of a video or, or television style system. Uh, to reduce the van load of folks that end up going from the detention facility or in some days multiple van loads going over to the courthouse uh, all seated in the back of the courtroom one at a time in front of the judge back to the detention facility they go so it's pretty labor intensive to uh, transport folks from the detention setting to the court as most of the uh, facilities within counties have outgrown their uh, place, if you will, inside the courthouse where the jail was normally located. And so detention is located in a remote facility. The courts have taken over that space and expanded the courts. And so there is a, quite a transport issue. So the, the count, from the county perspective, we've desired to have that ability to do that court video arraignment, especially, and any specialty style hearings uh, that take place. The coordination that happens is members of the family, members of the public uh, can go to the courthouse, sit in the courtroom and see those proceedings on the big screen along with everyone else. So there is the public viewing, uh, family viewing of that court proceeding while the uh, inmate is at the jail in front of the camera. So let me share with you two uh, general observations, one from Laramie County and one from Converse County kind of on the video court um, perspective. So from Laramie County, the Lieutenant wrote, uh, we've been using video court extensively during the COVID event, with limited equipment we currently have. The plus side of this is the courts are not running at anywhere near their norm, which is, allows us to be able to manage the required appearances, but that will be changed in the next few months as they are working out the details to start opening the courts back up for more appearances. Our hope is to be able to continue and possibly enhance the practice of video court when things transition into quote, the new normal. We're trying to locate rooms within the facility where we could expand the video court to accommodate multiple court proceedings when things start ramping up and even contemplate running courts within the pods in the multi-purpose rooms. However, both of these solutions would require additional equipment, a great deal of coordination with the courts to adjust their schedule to accommodate this new and prolonged term change and possibly a long-term change to the court process. So several of the points that we raised earlier or the director did in terms of the equipment, the room, the space, the counties would share some of those concerns um, as well. Converse County wrote, uh, the sheriff says, due to the COVID issue, we began video court via Microsoft Teams. Program we wanted to start over a year ago, but we did not at that time have the support of the judge. Once the virus started, we received a request and approval from both judges to pursue video court programming. In implementing the program, we've since purchased a Windows-based video hub. This now allows us to conduct court for the inmates using a larger screen with cameras so that the judge and the inmate can see each other during the court proceedings. 
the cost of the county to set up the system was approximately $10,000 in just equipment alone. So as we look at the, the issue uh, back and forth between the, the room, the suitable space to be able to have that video uh, arraignment, the equipment in, on both sides to be able to do that, and the equipment within the courtroom to have that public viewing, that public access, the family being able to participate, uh, being important, and then the court procedures to be able to do that all need to be in place. And we are anxious to be able to continue that on a larger scale to save in both that security issues, the ease of transporting back and forth, the speed to, of getting folks through and potentially back out the door. Um, as the uh, video arraignments, generally the bond is set, folks can post the bond, but the person may have to sit at the courthouse and wait till all of those other folks are through with their arraignment before the transport vehicle can take everyone back to the detention facility to be processed out. So there's, there could be some um, time savings I would offer in that as well. And I think later uh, when um, Ms. Sharp speaks about costs, um, or I can give you some general discussions now. We can either wait and I'll come back around with some additional costs, or if you'd like to hear some of our discussions of costs now and, and do that. Let's go ahead while we have you here now to talk about costs. It is 9.30 committee and we only have about a half an hour scheduled for this particular topic, which is okay. We can obviously, we'll need some flexibility here, but just mindful of that time. So we'll go ahead and hear from you now, Mr. Odekoven. Thank you, Madam Chair. So working with um, uh, the courts uh, yesterday and kind of talking about some of those needs uh, and you, we've already discussed the idea of if you're setting up a full room with that larger screen television, uh, the monitor, the stand, the computer, the webcam, the microphones, the sound, uh, the cabling, the hub, the infrastructure, the bandwidth, there's a host of things that go into it. Um, looks like about 16, 16, five, uh, for that room to be able to do some of those kinds of things. As far as I know, there's only a couple of those systems in place now. So a number of jails would be looking to add that level of sophistication. If we were to do just a desktop, the computer, much as many of us are doing the Zoom now, uh, kind of a scenario um, and do that within a room, again, you'd still have the hub the cabling, the bandwidth, some of those issues, but that cost goes roughly in half uh, if we're just doing the desktop version. If you end up with the laptop version, the cost comes down slightly, but not all that much because you still have to have the hub, the infrastructure, the bandwidth, et cetera. And of course, I think as Laramie County described, they were able to uh, find a solution by utilizing iPad tablets, uh, kind of as the one-on-one -on -one, uh, fix, if you will, uh, for each person has then passed the tablet and views the judge on the tablet and goes, and that is slightly less at about $4,600 um, option. So um, there's significant costs involved, but I believe the, the benefit is there. And the, uh, if I understood correctly, the COVID money looks to some of these kinds of solutions as viable uses for some of those funds, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Odekoven, Representative Gray. Thank you, Madam Chairman, uh, Mr. Odekoven. So just like when we were talking with the, the Department of Corrections, I mean, they, they gave us sort of the, the ask, but then they also talked a little bit about what the savings are specifically on average transportation costs. Uh, so, I mean, you alluded to that in your testimony and also uh, to, to personnel costs, but what was the discussion in this meeting yesterday about the saving side of this uh, after the investment is made? Mr. Odekoven. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. We did not, uh, the, the focus of the meeting yesterday was more the discussion of the TV camera, uh, microphone infrastructure hub discussion was not within each of our element staff savings times, uh, if you will. And in terms of cost, it, it would vary from county to county. The question is, am I on a five mile journey uh, to the courthouse? Um, as Laramie County might be, or am I across the street journey um, as it exists in several of the other communities? So there's significant difference, differentiation between costs. We did not uh, venture into a cost savings discussion 
This was more a uh, time savings, security savings, personnel savings in general. Uh, it would take a much longer review to be able to come up with a hard and fast number on uh, X number of arraignments conducted a year, saved X number of transports from the detention facility to the, to the courthouse. Some facilities actually provide that uh, as part of their report uh, back from the sheriff to the county commissioners as part of the budgetary process and actually talks about uh, the number of transports that they conducted and the number of people that they have uh, designated for that court security, court transport process. So uh, given some time, we could come up with some of those numbers. Follow up representative. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chairman. I would just say that that I don't think this conversation is complete until we we have that. I mean, it's a two sided thing. It's it's not just the the quote unquote investment is often the ter the term used, but then there is a back end savings. And with where we are right now, I, I don't think our committee is doing the complete work if if we don't have that. So thank you very much. I would uh, just put a note in everyone's minds. We'll have this afternoon, um, Jeremiah Riemann, the ex executive director for the Wyoming County Commissioners Association. If he's listening, maybe he could also communicate with some of his counties to have an understanding of that, that we might get some more information here this afternoon on that question. Um, Representative Washa, did you have your hand up? No? Okay. Mr. Odokoven, anything else? No, Madam Chair. Thank you. All right. With that, we'll go to the wonderful Lily Sharp here, who I see has joined us um, so timely. Great to see you this morning, Ms. Sharp. Good morning, well, Chairman. Good, good morning, Chairman. Good morning, committee. I, I am Lily Sharp. I am the state court administrator. And on the phone with me or on the meeting with me is Julie Gowen, our chief information officer. And we're here really to, to, to answer any questions you have about how the courts are our video conferencing and the solution that we found. And the first thing we wanted to say is that we highly support funding the counties for uh, additional technology for their jails. What we have found is that although we have a great solution and that, and Julie will explain it to you in just a minute, um, it's not fully built out throughout the state, but even though we have this good system, if the end user doesn't have a good system, it, it doesn't do any good. And so we have definitely had judges that um, have complained because they can't hear the, in, uh, the inmate very well they can't see them very well, or they may have a very small screen that they're looking from. And so, for example, in Laramie, in Laramie County, the district courts have been able to do their remote video conferencing, but the circuit courts have not, because what we were told is that they only have two iPads, and so they're, they can't, and there's seven judges. So the availability of those iPads is just limited, and that requires then that Either the, either the inmate appears just by, by phone, which is, is really not satisfactory, or that the inmate is brought over to the court. And again, you have to remember in the COVID experience, when the inmate's brought over to the court, you, have, you are exposing both the inmate and, the, and all of the participants in the courtroom to possible, um, to possible exposure to the COVID virus. So um, with that, we just want to say we, we really support giving funding to the counties to, um, for these systems. What we have found about five years ago, our system, our video conferencing system was very antiquated. The judges um, said it was not reliable and the justices were not happy with it. So what our staff did, Julie Gowen, um, our chief information officer and her staff, researched a lot of different uh, possible solutions. The one they came up with is a Microsoft solution. And it, it and Julia explained there's two, really two components to it, but, but it also actually there's more than two because you have to have a very good internet network to uh, accommodate the, this equipment. But the part of the reason why they chose this system is because it is CGIS, as you probably all remember, it's chief um, or it's a, uh, criminal justice information systems certified. It also has a number of other certifi certificates and it's encrypted. So it's very, although we like, although Zoom is good, um, it is, does not have all these um, 
they, it doesn't have all the security features that that we have. And with that, if you, if you don't mind, Chairman, I'll, I'll turn it over to Julie to explain a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah, Ms. Gwen, if you'd like to go ahead and, um, is she on the phone? I think she is, right? Um, Madam Chairman, I'm by video. Can oh, great. I see you now. Wonderful. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome. Introduce yourself again to the committee and, and please let us know how things are going. Thank you, Madam Chairman. My name is Julie Gowen and I'm the Chief Information Officer for the Wyoming Judicial Branch. Um, like Lily alluded to earlier, we did um, review our audio system, video conferencing system a few years ago, and we did decide on Microsoft in addition to um, the hubs, we use Microsoft Office 365, of which Microsoft Teams video conferencing platform is included in that. Um, in addition to that, when we rolled this out, uh, we also increased our internet bandwidth uh, statewide at all of our locations because you have a finite amount of bandwidth that's available and um, using video conferencing chews up quite a bit of bandwidth. So we did go ahead and do that. And like Lily said, it is also CGIS and FedRAMP certified. So we're um, concerned about the security of the system. So that's why we um, chose Teams. And Ma Madam Chairman. Yes. The, the um, and I, I'm sure you're aware of what it is, but the, the Surface Hub is, and I think the Chief Justice actually explained at the last meeting, it is, it looks just like a, a huge TV monitor, but it has, but it, but it has an incredibly good audio system and an incredibly good video system. And so what, um, what, what Julie had quoted um, the, Julie, actually, will you explain, did you include in this, in your quote for, or your estimate for Byron, that full room, does that include a surface hub? Um, at this point, uh, am I not, okay, I just want to make sure I wasn't muted. Um, it does not include a surface hub. What it does include for the, the full room solution is a 70 inch monitor, a stand and a computer and a web camera. That is to make sure that whatever conferencing, um, video conferencing that any of the end um, users are using. Um, for example, if you have a hospital that's using WebEx and uh, of course using Teams, having a system like that will make it more um, vendor agnostic and able to be used uh, more widely. Oh, I think you're muted, Chairman. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for that testimony. Any questions from the committee? All right, seeing none. Um, thank you both so much for being here this morning. We're going to go ahead and move to um, Mr. Dimple, the CEO of Northern Wyoming Mental Health Center. Center. Do we have him available here? Here. Madam Chairwoman, yes. uh, he is available as well as Andrea Summerfield. Great, wonderful. So we'll hear from Mr. Dimple first. Uh, Mr. Dimple, welcome to the committee. It's great to see you again. If you would introduce yourself um, so all of those watching live can know who you are and, and hear what you have to say. So thank you and welcome. Okay, uh, can you hear me, Madam Chairman? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, uh, my name is Paul Dimple. I'm the CEO of Northern Wyoming Mental Health and um, I've been in the community mental health system about 31 years here in Wyoming. Uh, I worked 26 years at Central Wyoming Counseling Center uh, before coming up to Northern five years ago. So I have pretty extensive experience within the community mental health and substance abuse system. I wanted to uh, give an overview first uh, in terms of um, what we were doing, how we responded to telehealth, how we're getting impacted by um, the um, COVID as well as the amount of involvement we have with DOC uh, folks from the outpatient side of things. Um, we responded very quickly to the COVID crisis uh, turning our business model around to do telehealth within about a week and a half. And the reason we were able to do that was we were kind of ahead of the game in terms of uh, we had all of our staff already with laptops. We had everybody with these headsets because it just made communicating much easier. Um, everybody has, uh, not everybody, but several people has mentioned Teams. Microsoft Teams has been critical to our company's uh, ability to uh, 
communicate and have ongoing uh, communications on working together. It's Microsoft Teams ha has been really good. Um, we didn't use Microsoft Teams for doing our telehealth work because it really became problematic in terms of how do you bring people in? You have to invite guests and it became a lot easier to do Zoom with some enhanced security. Um, I got to uh, send a shout out to the Wyoming Telehealth Network. Uh, those folks just got inundated and responded, worked weekends to get all the providers that were asking to get on that network. It has been incredibly valuable to us, uh, that system. Uh, how we re responded was we had to start reaching out to folks and getting email addresses and, and setting up Zoom and, and doing all those things. We were initially very concerned with uh, people's ability and were they going to be connected or who's not going to even have a phone. Uh, we had dollars set aside to buy phones. We bought very few phones. Uh, I think we, we paid for some internet service. Um, but by and large, people seem to be connected. Uh, as kind of a cue, we uh, serve Sheridan, Johnson, um, Weston, and Crook counties. And so depending on what county you're in, the problem really, and I keep hearing it uh, with different folks, is bandwidth. Because uh, sometimes you're in an area where even if you have the money to buy bandwidth, you can't get the bandwidth. And so I think the infrastructure for Wyoming in terms of bandwidth, being able to continue to move towards more and more telehealth, um, I, I I think needs a, a critical look. Um, sorry, I saw Mary Beth shot something across and I can't multitask, obviously. Um, in terms of the services we're providing, we went and we're doing telehealth with groups. We're doing telehealth individually. We're doing telehealth um, with families. Uh, we're doing uh, Title 25 evaluations via telehealth. Um, because jails and places, hospitals and everything had shut down. Um, we, in addition to that, have signed up with the Department of Corrections just pre-COVID to start jail-based IOP. And uh, we're in Johnson County, we're gonna go in, they're gonna bring people in specifically to the Johnson County Jail to do uh, intensive outpatient treatment for substance abuse. Well, then COVID hit and now we have moved to um, doing that via telehealth and instead of in person. And um, uh, the problem is, there haven't been that many folks moving around the system yet. So I expect that to, to kind of uh, get up and running. So the next thing I would like to do, I don't know if uh, Madam Chair, if anybody has any questions for me, uh, I do have some quick data. It'll take me quick to run through to show the uh, distribution of DOC clients from the outpatient perspective. Um, whether you'd like me to do that or take questions or why don't you go ahead? It doesn't look like there are any questions pending right now, so it's a good time just to move forward with that information. And Madam Chair, do you you have the presentation? I have it here. Do I share? What's the best way to do that? Um, Madam Chair, I can't hear you. We do have the presentation, and so does the public. They can access those materials. Okay. So we can just work through it with you if you just tell us when you're moving on to the slide instead of having it come up probably easier um, for purposes of this this format. Okay, so I'm just gonna start with the first slide and I apologize for not numbering uh, the slides because I know that helps. First slide, this was through last night, all the people in all four counties, how many people have we served? How many distinct individuals? And it was 1,436. Out of that, the majority were on the mental health side, 1,089 with 510 being on the substance abuse side. If we go to the next slide, um, DOC involved clients, and I broke that up between mental health and uh, substance abuse. And I'm going to clarify here, there's people that are on probation, people know what that is, people are on parole, and then there's a, a category called criminal justice. There's a slew of people that are somewhere in the system, but may have not been adjudicated, adjudicated yet. Uh, so they may have an upcoming trial, they 
you know, uh, have DUIs waiting or they're waiting sentencing. There's all of those somewhere in the system, but doesn't fall into those other two categories in jail. So that's kind of that bucket, the criminal justice bucket. And, and you can see that um, uh, the distribution for both segments, primarily uh, uh, probation, then criminal justice, then a much smaller amount of people up in our area on parole. Um, out of all of the clients, 57% uh, of the people we treat, uh, whether in mental health or substance abuse, have some involvement with the criminal justice system. Uh, you can see that, that um, uh, the distribution there, and again, that's for all clients. Then I'll move on to the next page. And the next page says, well, what about the mental health people? And what out of all of the, the mental health people, about 29% are involved with the criminal justice system in one way or another. Then if we go to the last slide, the substance abuse clients, 97% of the folks in our substance abuse programs are involved with the um, criminal justice system in some way, uh, fashion or another. And I'll tell you, I ran these numbers last night and I knew it was high. I didn't know it was 97%, but it makes sense. We always knew our primary service delivery is intensive outpatient, which is three hours a, a week or three hours, a three hour group, three times a week. So nine hours a week. That's generally where most people are following in terms of the type of treatment they get. So the majority of these folks will be getting that, that level of of treatment. Um, the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll say before I, I stand for any questions and, and turn it over to, to Ms. Somerville. Um, one of the ideas I had when I was uh, listening to the director speak, and it's just a small little niche, right now, if somebody's coming out of prison, um, we know we get notification sometimes, sometimes we don't. Uh, they may need mental health or substance abuse services. I think telehealth could, if a system, statewide system was set up to say, if somebody's coming out, they usually know well in advance, you know, probably a month in advance, they're coming back to our community. We could connect up before they ever get here and uh, connect with that person to a soft handoff and have them connected up with services before they ever land in our community. I think that uh, would help because sometimes people get, it's not discharged, I guess it's released um, and come and they're supposed to come. And then for various reasons they don't or they miss appointments. So that was uh, uh, one thought I had on that. Mr. Dimple, thank you so much. I'm just going to quickly ask our LSO staff before we move to Ms. Somerville, do we have a quorum? I see that a number of representatives are not currently present, but it's hard for me to see everyone all at once. Oh, fascinating. Okay, Chairman, great. Chairman Ellicott, I, I believe there is a quorum still. I counted eight, at least eight on the screen. Thank you. Representative Washett, you have a question. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. This quick question for Mr. Dimple. Uh, it looks like your system is designed to integrate mental health and substance abuse treatment, while the Department of Corrections described to us uh, two separate contracting uh, approaches where they have one contract for mental health and one contract for substance abuse. Could you describe for us just briefly the advantages of having one entity like Northwest Mental Health provide both substance abuse and psychiatric care. Mr. Dimple. Uh, Madam Chairman, Representative Washett, we have, and, and this has been a, a long problem in the history of mental health and substance abuse treatment, the bifurcation of there's just people with mental illness and there's just people with substance abuse. It really doesn't work that way. In fact, what we're finding is the people, these 97% these there in substance abuse, on a functional level, really are on a functional level with mental illness in terms of their abilities to take care of themselves. And so what we're finding is if you get too specialized, like if I'm too specialized in mental health, uh, I'm gonna miss some substance abuse stuff. And if I get too specialized in, in, in uh, the other way, then I'm gonna miss the other side. So um, there are specialties, but I think the, the marriage of that and having a system that, that integrates, even if you had 
two different systems, but they were integrated together to make it the flow easier. But by and large, if, if somebody does their entire work in substance abuse, um, they're not going to pick up on the kinds of things I would uh, as a person who has a large background with the mental illness. So the system largely is going that way, but even our, our state dollars now are split that way. You know, internally, we have to, to make it happen. Any follow-up, Representative Washett? No, thank you. All right, great. With that, we'll move to Ms. Somerville. Ms. Somerville, welcome. If you'd introduce yourself to the committee and um, those members of the public that are watching live stream. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. My name is Andrea Somerville, and I represent the Wyoming Association of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Centers. And I, I just want to thank you guys for your time today. Uh, telehealth, as you can imagine, has been a near and dear conversation to our hearts uh, before COVID, but even more so now. Um, so I just wanted to start out by just kind of reminding everybody, I know we had some discussions last year. So our community mental health centers serve all 23 counties. There's about 17, 18 different uh, business organizations that run those facilities in those counties. As it relates to your discussion with DOC, our centers serve the largest portion of DOC for mental health and substance abuse in the state. Uh, the percentages vary from a center that might only have 30% of criminally involved clients to some of our centers, it's 95% of their clients are, are criminally involved uh, with DOC or local probation. And so we've, uh, as you imagine over the last 70 days, the the centers have moved very quickly to telehealth. Again, this was something that was already in progress. Investment in the systems were being made. A number of the centers were already working on telehealth, but we ramped that up significantly in March with the local development and the declaration of the state of emergency in March. And so what I can tell you now is that all of our centers offer telehealth services for both mental health and substance abuse. Uh, they offer them both for individual and group therapy, but it varies a little bit right now what they're doing in terms of services from center to center. Some of our centers are fully telehealth. They're not seeing anybody in person right now. Uh, some of the centers are not. Um, an example, one of our centers that has a, a high DOC population or DOC involved population, uh, they right now they, they've split out, for example, their substance abuse IOP groups. They keep those groups into less than 10 people put them in separate locations and then stream them together to conduct their group therapy. Uh, but then on the other side, they're still seeing individual clients in person. And so what we found generally is that uh, there's been a pretty decent acceptance. Most of the centers uh, are reporting very little drop in the number of criminally involved clients that are making their appointments and, and coming for their treatment. Um, there are a few that have reported a drop, but it's it's slight. It's really not uh, maybe even statistically significant, especially given the circumstances. So they're they're pretty happy with that. Um, all of the some of the or I'm sorry, some of the community mental health providers have had to take the step to provide phones with Zoom capability or uh, other devices to the clients to make sure that they can connect. Um, I know we have one center in particular, again, with a high DOC uh, involved population that they make sure that they have that capability when they're discharged from residential and transition into outpatient, treat outpatient treatment so that they can continue to have that connection back to the providers when they're released in the community. That's a pretty important, important part of the program is making sure that the client has the ability, uh, especially when you're dealing with somebody that's, you know, uh, coming back into the community, looking for employment and all of those other things, we need to take that burden uh, off their plate and make sure that they can have that connectivity. Um, just a, a few comments in general about telehealth. So this was a topic, as you can imagine, of great discussion at the Labor Health meeting last week. And I, there were some comments a little earlier about uh, acceptance of providers in using telehealth. And so I just wanted to share a few things with you uh, in regards to where we're at and information that the Wyoming Telehealth Network shared last week with Labor Health. The majority, so two thirds of the registered users right now with Wyoming Telehealth Network are behavioral health providers. I think the numbers are, there's 360 primary care providers and 665 behavioral health providers. So on the mental health substance abuse side, our providers are there. They're, they're fully integrated, if I can use that, that terminology. Um, and then they talked about, you know, telehealth has been a work in progress and the, the groups that are advocating for this have been using a, 
they said they need the three P's. They need provider accept or patient acceptance, provider acceptance, and payer acceptance. And although the payer acceptance may not be as important for the discussions around criminally involved clients, it's important for the providers uh, to know that they're going to be reimbursed and that they can continue to support that service, uh, that telehealth capability in their business practices. All of our community mental health centers are independent nonprofits. They're all 501c3s, so they still have to make the books work. Um, and what we've seen during the COVID crisis is, frankly, a great leap forward in terms of telehealth acceptance from both Medicaid and Medicare. They're allowing for both audio only and audio visual uh, individual and group therapy, as well as the private insurance companies. Now, I would caveat that and say those are temporary changes. And that's something that we're working on to make permanent because we think that telehealth uh, for mental health and substance abuse is a very important tool to have in the toolbox for everybody, uh, especially DOC clients. So we're, we're making some uh, forward motion on that. Uh, Labor Health uh, Committee last week passed a telehealth parity bill for mental health and substance abuse to go forward, I believe, to the next special session if one is held uh, to help, again, try to address those issues and make that more of a permanent change. Um, I just want to by, end by just pointing out a couple of specific issues we've had regarding uh, or concerns with criminally involved clients in telehealth, specifically the sex offenders group. That's a difficult group uh, to work with in terms of their access to technology. And so what we've seen uh, and, and through conversations with DOC from our individual centers is right now for the sex offender groups, they're using audio only when telehealth is the option. Um, obviously there's some drawbacks to that. Audio is better than nothing. Let me just say that for sure. However, when you don't have that video connection or you're not in person, you as a provider, you lose that ability to gain feedback on body language and all of those important things. So that's an ongoing conversation with DOC. Um, we had discussed briefly potentially pursuing supervised use of the internet for that particular group of, of DOC clients. And there are some HIPAA or HIPAA considerations because especially for the group sessions, which they hold, you would have to essentially get sign off from everybody to have somebody else in the room that was supervising. And there's a lot of logistical concerns. We're not done having that conversation, but that's an issue right now. So for right now, they're just uh, doing audio or being seen in person, depending on the facility that's available. Um, lastly, just, uh, just some thoughts on discussion for funding telehealth. Uh, so our community mental health centers have made a significant investment in the last 70 days to make sure everything is up to snuff. There are some issues that are still out there. We have last mile fiber issues for a few of our centers. And uh, the Wyoming Broadband Council uh, spoke to Labor Health last week about their kind of their, their program and what they're doing to go forward with that. And there was a lot of good discussion at Labor Health about how we could potentially use CARES Act money to plug some of those holes uh, to really make sure that we've got broadband, uh, good, good bandwidth availability where we need it. There, for our centers on telehealth, there is also a discussion about uh, electronic health record and client portal availability for telehealth visits. So right now, it's a little bit burdensome. So when we see somebody over telehealth, uh, a lot of times somebody is you know, talking to that person on the phone, taking all the information by hand, then re-inputting it to the system. And there are better ways to do that right now, but it's going to require some investment. We're still investigating what that looks like. It could be you know, as little as a $30,000 change to their already existing electronic health record to maybe couple it with a client portal, or it could be much more significant than that, depending on which vendor each of the centers are using. It's a little bit complicated right now. Um, we want to support uh, continuing investment for tech for our centers and for the clients. So it's important, again, that we make sure the clients have the ability to, to connect back in, and that is a cost. Uh, that a lot of our centers have been funding out of their quality of life dollars. And then a few centers still need some investment uh, in telehealth technology, replacing computers, uh, replacing old antiquated systems, making sure that their security is up to snuff. And then we just lastly want to, uh, I want to end by supporting investing in technology for the, for DOC facilities, county jails, 
transition facilities. Uh, as our, our vice president for WAMSAC, Paul Dimple stated, um, that ability to, to transition uh, anybody that's on release and make contact before they actually leave is a really important tool we think for the future and was already under discussion before COVID hit. Uh, it's, it's critical to make sure that all of those locations have the ability for uh, their clients to interact and reach the providers at the mental health centers when telehealth is, is necessary or frankly with budget cuts maybe become the necessity to reduce transportation costs and things along those lines. So with that, I will stop and stand for any questions. All right, looks like we do have some, Ms. Somerville, thank you. Representative Burlingame. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, thanks, Andy. This is uh, not tailored only to the telehealth um, COVID-19 conversation that we're having, but I, I was reached out by a, to by a constituent who had a question about how inmates access mental health. And I, I didn't have the answer. Um, it was her understanding that the inmate who is a sex offender requested counseling, requested mental health um, connections and that those were not available to him. So what's your understanding of what that process is and like what the redress is if we have folks who desire mental health help but can't access it. Uh, Ms. Somerville, if you can, and I'll just put a plug out there for Director Lampert or Deputy Director Shannon to listen in and maybe have you come back in to potentially answer any of those questions if you can. So feel free to put your video back up and we'll uh, let Ms. Somerville answer the question. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman and Representative Berlingame. I think it's a very important question and uh, I hope we get uh, the director, the deputy director back on because I, I would like them to uh, talk a little bit about how that works in their facilities so I don't misspeak for them. I will tell you once they're released and out back into the community, uh, I mean, it, it is as simple as us as they just have to make contact with us. Sometimes that contact comes through uh, a referral from a parole or probation officer or that person walks in individually, uh, but I would defer the question back to Director Lampert. Director Lampert, I see that um, you're available. Uh, did you, were you able to hear the question from Representative Burlingame, which is access to sex offender treatment um, by, by offenders? I don't think we know whether it's pre-conviction or post-conviction or while incarcerated, but if you can speak broadly to some of that, those pieces. Madam Chairman, <clears throat> uh, we do offer uh, mental health access to all of our inmates. Uh, it can happen one of several ways. One is through a health services request initiated by the individual. The other is simply by staff referral uh, or referral by medical staff for mental health or referral by the substance abuse staff for mental health. So there's a number of referral processes, but the inmate simply has to fill out a uh, request for, for mental health services. Our chronic mental health population is uh, you know, scheduled and routinely seen uh, by the psychiatrist and, and by our mental health staff. For sex offender treatment, uh, we have a formalized residential treatment program as well as outpatient programs. Typically they're delivered <clears throat> in the last few years of incarceration uh, simply because of capacity reasons. Uh, and we prioritize that population uh, to reduce their risk prior to reentry. So if, if a person requests access to substance, I mean, to sex offender treatment itself, uh, it's determined more by sentence structure than it is by request. However, if they have um, co-occurring substance abuse or, or co-occurring mental health needs, those will be met outside of the actual sex offender treatment access. Director, what about upon release on probation or parole? Um, what does that treatment look like, if you can? Well, what we through our reentry program, we try to schedule everybody uh, for follow up with the regional medical or mental health uh, providers. Uh, there, there's sometimes a gap between the time that, that they get out and, and access those services. Uh, you, and that's part of the, what we're looking at 
uh, in conjunction with the uh, Labor and Health Committee and Department of, of Health uh, and looking at access uh, and the gaps of it through this interim period and, and, and into the next year, uh, we will have a um, quality assurance unit that will be looking at, at those issues. Uh, so some of that, the reason why people aren't, aren't making the connection uh, to try to access and determine what those reasons are and ways to close those gaps. Uh, but typically what's happening is they'll get that initial referral and then uh, oftentimes they don't follow up uh, with continued treatment after that point. So those are the kind of gaps that we're working with Department of Health to try to address. Any follow-up, Representative Burlingame? No, all right, Representative Washett. Thank you, Madam Chair. This might go to a number of the people who've been presenting this morning, but I just wanna make sure we're not heading down a road where we're gonna run into some compatibility problems down as time goes on. If, if the courts are using one system, jails are using something different, uh, the courts are using something different, uh, medical providers are using something different, mental health professionals are using something different. I just wanna make sure if we start expending a lot of money to, to make this type of uh, telehealth uh, system operable, that we don't run into a problem where party A can't talk to party B because they're on the wrong platform. Can somebody assure me that there's compatibility between all these various systems that can be overcome without great expense? Great question, Representative Washett. I think Ms. Goyan from the court uh, threw out a term that I thought was pretty pretty poignant, which was uh, vendor agnostic. So I don't know if she'd like to comment or anyone else would like to provide some feedback on the ability of all of these um, tech ap applications to work with each other. Ms. Goyan? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I can't really speak to the telehealth, but what I can tell you about the Teams platform is you do not have to have Teams to be able to participate in a Teams meeting. What you need is an internet connected device and uh, either downloading a free Teams app or using um, an internet browser. Ms. Somerville. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, and Representative Washett, from the telehealth piece, the, the answer is it's similar to what Ms. Goyan said, is that you don't have to have uh, special technology to use Zoom. You can use it from your phone. And the advantage we have here in Wyoming is because the Wyoming Telehealth Network Consortium exists, um, that's become the standard, at least for mental health and substance abuse. And I understand it's it's pretty popular with the medical providers as well, because it's, a, it's an easy way to use a, a platform that is HIPAA compliant, which is one of our biggest concerns. And so I, right now we're not seeing any issues with people being able to access that because it's just as simple as needing uh, an internet connection and an internet browser if you don't use the Zoom uh, app or, or software on your system. A representative Washett follow up. Thank you, that does delay my concerns. All right, wonderful. With that committee, we do have um, some public comment. We have Dr. Barry here with us and he has joined us into the room. Uh, Dr. Barry, if you wanna turn on your video so we can all see you. Does anyone see Dr. Barry yet? I don't quite yet. But I see you, Dr. Barry. Dr. Richard Barry is here. Um, Dr. Barry, if you would uh, unmute yourself and introduce yourself to the committee. We would love to hear uh, your comments this morning. So thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Dr. Barry. I'm a psychologist in marriage and family therapy. I've worked at Youth Alternatives here in Cheyenne for 35 years, spent a lot of time working with lots and lots of families. And when this COVID thing hit, we were totally just, you know, really concerned about what we were going to do. We were generally opposed to telehealth. Uh, because we're so much moving towards non-personal connection with people. Uh, and so when this occurred, we thought, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? Uh, fortunately, our director, Jay Sullivan, uh, jumped in and acted very quickly. He 
signed us up for Zoom. Uh, one of the things that I didn't know about Zoom is there's a free one that only allows you 40 minutes, but for an upgrade for $20 a month, but a minimum of 10 people, uh, it's $2,400 a year. So we fortunately had laptops and tablets, so we were able to just immediately begin telehealth with our clients. Uh, over the past, you know, since about March 15th, I've conducted 162 Zoom sessions with my families, uh, and I've been surprised. And so kind of my contribution today is more of a personal sort of thing. I was really surprised at how well it worked. I was surprised at the connection that we were able to make. Uh, some of the families that I was already seeing, they made the transition quite easily because we already had a connection. But families that were new that I picked up, uh, I was really surprised at how quickly they adapted to it. And one of the comments that I've received from a family that I've never seen in person said, wow, this has really ended up being very helpful. We're really glad we we're able to do this. So, you know, the safety component really was critical because I'm not with them, they're not with me. Uh, and so the viability of, of Zoom and doing telehealth has really, I mean, I'm convinced that it's a good thing to do and we are going to continue to provide this service even when we can have people in back in the office. Uh, there was a couple surprises. One was, you know, obviously people that come from a long distance, um, they'd much rather do Zoom because that just is easier for them and for their family and for their busyness that they have. The other thing though that I was not aware of that really did surprise me was there are a couple, two or three families that I'm seeing that the family actually talks more openly and more readily through Zoom. Uh, so, and I guess I wasn't surprised too much because kids are used to talking on their phones, uh, but it's just one step less intense. And so some people are just more comfortable with that and the, the sessions actually have ended up being more helpful and more open and more in depth. So I was really pleased with that. Um, so it's, it's significantly better than just a phone call. Being able to see is extremely helpful. Uh, the cons though uh, are, you know, the Wi-Fi sporadic at times. Uh, dealing with a family with more than four people uh, gets really difficult because I can't see them all. Uh, on occasion, there's someone outside of the view of the screen and so when that person came back in view, they were obviously upset. I didn't know that. So, you know, it's not as good as being there in person, but it's certainly a viable option. And it's certainly one we're going to continue to provide after the COVID thing subsides. Dr. Berry, thank you. I think that's actually very helpful information to us. And as it applies to um, youth alternatives and inmate treatment populations, I know in discussions in previous years, our Department of Corrections has an inpatient treatment unit, unit which does substance abuse treatment, of course, and that is inpatient. Uh, we cut that funding and we have restored it, but just to talk about this unique opportunity maybe to continue to provide enhanced treatment options to at-risk populations at reduced costs. And so if you could just briefly explain to kind of youth alternatives what its purpose is, just so that the committee knows and kind of has that mindful um, concept associated with how it could overall save the state money, particularly as it relates to our inmate population? Yes. Uh, well, Youth Alternatives, we're actually a department of the city. We've been around for almost 50 years now. Uh, we originally started out as, as probation officers, uh, but part of what we ended up doing was saying we can also do some preventative things that will keep kids from ending up in the juvenile justice system. So we have a mentor program. We have a lot of family counselors that provide a lot of hopefully information and services that will keep kids out of the juvenile system. Um, so that's sort of the program. And we see probably, I don't know, five to 600 families a year uh, with the idea of helping them move ahead as a family, be more productive. We end up with, I have several families right now that dad's incarcerated. Uh, we certainly try to include dads and moms as well. Um, and so when the, incarcerated person is released, we try to influence them, try to help them and integrate them back into the community. Because even though dad's or mom has been away, the kid still wants that dad or mom involved in their life. So that's part of how we end up kind of coordinating on, at times anyway. 
Thank you, Dr. Berry. Co-Chairman Kirkbride. Thank you, Madam Co-Chairman. Dr. Berry, if we were to apply money uh, to this problem in your context, how could it be utilized? Um, well, at this particular point, um, continuing to have the Zoom subscription, uh, you know, is going to be helpful because once the COVID money is gone, we're not going to have any money to continue to pay for the Zoom subscriptions. So even that's, you know, for us, that's $2,400 a year, but it's still $2,400. So that would be something that would be helpful for us. Thank you, Dr. Murray. Follow up, Co-Chairman? No, thank you. All right, Representative Jennings. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Dr. Berry, I, I just have a, an outside question for you. Uh, just, just thinking about it from the standpoint of, uh, you know, we, we'll go out to a restaurant. Well, we used to go out to a restaurant and we'd see <laughs> four people, a family sitting at a table, all using their phones when they were three feet and they weren't even social distancing. They were three feet from each other. As an overall picture of you being an expert, is there concern that uh, in using this format, and, and you've expressed a couple of things that kind of worry you a little bit if you have more than four patients, but is there a, an overall concern into some of this telehealth and telemedicine that, um, you know, we, we watch young people and they become addicted or they have issues with the video and stuff like that. Do you have con some concerns that we're headed and that maybe we're even exacerbating some of the some of the basic things that happen in a family or the the one on one? The, the, the being able to deal with them one-on-one -on -one in person, as opposed to, I have con some concerns that we're headed down the road that uh, we might be exacerbating some, some of those psychological problems. Could you speak to that just a little bit for me? Thank you. Yes, Madam, Madam, yes, Madam Chairman, Representative. I share those same concerns. That's partly why we never were going to go this direction. Uh, I'm very concerned about our youth and their ability and their social skills. Uh, we're seeing so many kids on the autism spectrum that have trouble and struggles with identifying social cues and being able to interact appropriately socially. But when our kids learn that the way you communicate is via the iPhone, I think we're really handicapping our kids. So I'm very concerned about that. And that's part of the reason we did not want to go in this direction. However, when I'm given a choice of a phone call or no contact, then telehealth via Zoom is a great option. And so I'm hoping that the majority of the families that I end up seeing will come back to the office so that we can have that personal connection so that I can move families around. I can move a, fa you know, a family person from one couch to the other couch and rearrange them if I need to. It's just harder to do that on Zoom. So um, it's a matter of, it, what choices I have available. If I can only see a family via Zoom, then I'll take it. If I can see them in person, I would much rather prefer that because I think it's, you see much more information, you're more accurate in what you're able to do. Um, but there's a lot of families out there that can't get to the office. And I was surprised that most everybody had a phone and most everybody, I mean, I had not one client say, I can't do this. Uh, everybody has a phone, it seems like, and everybody has access to Zoom. So very concerned, but it depends on what choices you have available. Dr. Barry, thank you. Very helpful. Seeing no further questions from the committee, I want to thank you for your time here this morning and um, hanging in with us for the last couple of hours. Thank you. Uh, you've provided I appreciate helpful you. information, so thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We have no further public comment on this topic committee where it's 1020. Um, we're supposed to be moving on to our next item on the agenda this morning. So I'm going to take this topic back to the committee for further discussion. We do have Director Lampert still available. Um, and then after we're finished here, we'll take a short break and then transition into the liability immu immunity issue just so the committee knows. Uh, Representative Gray. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'd like to move uh, LSO to draft a, a bill draft uh, for the Department of Corrections request for 
$95,000 for two wall mounted units and one mobile unit. And then that would be paired with a $250,000 reduction in the upcoming biennium for operational expenses based on a, a pretty conservative estimate of the travel reductions that they, uh, they gave us. And that would also include some findings on the front that we anticipate telehealth to yield savings in the Department of Corrections beyond uh, this, this bill as well. Moved by Representative Gray, is there a second? Second. Seconded by Representative Jennings. Uh, any discussion? Uh, Senator Von Flatern. Thank you. I believe it was 198,000 and they're hoping to have um, reductions in uh, travel, but that would be 198,000 would be an amendment to Representative Gray's. Uh, committee members, would you like to hear from the director on this, Representative Gray? Clarifying facts. Yeah, it looks like the committee's nodding their heads. So why don't we get the, that information? Or Deputy Director Shannon, whomever can answer those questions. Um, give you a minute to put your video back on and unmute yourselves. Madam Chairman? Yes, Director. Uh, the $95,000 estimate is for two wall mounted units, one at the penitentiary, one at WMCI, and then three uh, suitcase units that would allow us to uh, have access at each of the other three facilities. That's the least expensive option. The 198,000 would allow for uh, a wall mounted unit at each of the institutions, as well as two rapid response units or suitcase units that could be taken to uh, a housing unit, for example, if there was emergent situation. So that would be the ideal in terms of maximizing access for, for telemedicine, but the cost is 198,000 for that. In regards to the, the operational cost savings, again, uh, estimating that we can do our best, um, but most, most of those costs, again, are, are deferred costs. Uh, in other words, our staff may not have to transport uh, inmates to a medical appointment, but that allows those staff to do other duties. So uh, it doesn't, I mean, uh, there will be some cost savings, but, but putting that amount in specific is going to be a little bit difficult and we can certainly provide the, the committee uh, with additional estimates, but I'm a little concerned about uh, you know, a set amount up front when we don't know what that will be. Thank you, Director. Uh, Representative, we'll go to Representative Ponell and then back to Representative Gray here. Representative Ponell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I'm a little concerned on uh, cutting or putting in this uh, 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 bill to cut funding when we're adding a certain amount. I, I would hesitate on the cutting and be more prone to just, to, you know, adding the uh, uh, either the 95,000 or 198,000, whichever the committee desires. But uh, uh, for us to go in and, and say that we're gonna cut this out of the next year's budget at this time frame is a little early, I believe. So uh, I think that uh, I, I would have concerns along with uh, Director Lambert on, on, on that cutting issue at this point. I would say, committee, just for um, process and procedure, the work that we're doing today and later this month on the COVID topic will only be addressed, theoretically, I guess we could do something different, but um, at the next special session when we meet at the end of the month um, together as the legislature. And so I believe that part of that meeting at the end of the month for the special session, the second special session, will have to do with the kind of one-time appropriations associated with CARES Act funding. Um, so uh, just, just kind of mindful of those parameters and pieces of information, but um, Representative Gray, back to you. 
Thank you, Madam Chairman. So responding to a couple of those points, I mean, first on the reduction, I, I just think we as a legislature, we got to get serious about this. I and mean, a $1.5 billion deficit. Um, I mean, this is a very conservative estimate. They gave us an estimate that, that it saves $100 to $150 per, per visit and transportation costs. I plugged in $125 and I did it across 1,000 visits. They have already are on track to save $600. And then they say with these additional units, that, that can be paid for. Um, I had the figures here. I mean, I, I used half of half of the increased uh, the uh, visits that they said they could get from the additional units. They said it was 600 uses. So I used half of that. I plugged in 900 and used the midpoint on the average. And I, I mean, I just, I think if, if we're not going to be, <laughs> I, I just think we, we as a bot, we as a legislature have to get have to lead a little bit more on getting some reductions in agency budgets rather than these 30,000 feet up viewpoint arguments on where we're gonna get reductions. We never see it in any bill. We never see it come from any standing committee outside of appropriations. You look at what, what our task is, the way it's worded from the management council, it's very clear that we can, we can consider uh, the DOC operations in light of COVID in addition to federal funding. And we're using the federal funds to yield efficiencies in the state budget. And I, I just think we're not doing our job if we don't consider the second one and we're just sitting here, we're gonna rubber stamp every single increase that is asked for and not look at ways that that is going to make their uh, operations more efficient. So I, I'm very passionate about this and, and I think, uh, the way that the bill is drafted. I think we get a good start in that way. We have another debate in the second meeting and I, I think that's a really good uh, good start the way it's laid out, so. All right, thank you, Representative. Uh, Senator Boner. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I appreciate the discussion. Just to point out, I agree with the, the good Chairwoman that uh, generally in the way that happened last time we made Sniffner reductions, the governor's office was the one that did that, frankly, as an institution, I think the legislature is a little bit more hardwired to spend money rather than save it. Um, uh, that being said, I think it is useful to help the governor. And uh, if we in still include the reduction element in a draft bill, and this is just a draft bill, it would require the Department of Corrections to do a little bit more work and, and refine the uh, the concept they've uh, brought to the committee as far as savings goes. It could help the Department of Corrections, as well as the governor's office, when those reductions do come, um, and, and obviously they are coming. So just a reminder that, like I said, last time uh, it was the governor, not the legislature, that made the cuts. Uh, that being said, I think it still is useful for the committee to retain this uh, the reductions in the bill because that will help us uh, moving forward. Thank you, Senator. Senator Von Flater. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I just have a parliamentary inquiry. Are we supposed to be um, how we spend the CARES Act money, or are we supposed to be cutting the parts of uh, whoever we do as agencies um, to cut their uh, operating funds? I, Senator, I don't think that anything's been clear. I mean, I would say that the purpose of us having COVID-related topics is to deal with COVID-related solutions. Um, I'll let the committee make their own determination as to what that means when it comes to these any motions or activities that we do. But I mean, the purpose of today is to hear from um, and to address, hear from those agencies and the public on the topics that have been assigned to us as it relates only to response to the pandemic. Um, you know, but but the legislature has a mind of its own, so. Uh, but I would say that's our directive. And that's, like, I think, an efficient use of our time representing that we have other committee work to get to and we'll come back to. But in order to be prepared for um, a short special session again and focused in on uh, being responsive to the pandemic, that that's, that's our, our purpose and scope. Uh, Representative Stith. Madam Chairman, thank you so much. Uh, on in support of the motion. The LSO has described our budget situation as trying to model the descent of a falling elevator and the coronavirus pandemic has caused uh, some of that dramatic de de decline in our revenues. I think having a placeholder number of 
trying to look for savings makes some sense so on and support. All right, Representative Gray has physically has his hand raised. I, I think we're ready for the question, Representative Gray, but one last opportunity um, to speak so we can move on with the morning. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I just want to note in, in the interim supplemental COVID topics, our fourth topic is reviewing operations of the criminal justice system. And I think that, that really allows us to look at the efficiencies through the investment of the COVID funds, the efficiencies that that yields in state funds. And I think that's what this bill draft motion does. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Gray. Lovely closing argument. Senator Cost, I see you also physically raising your hand. Did you want to say something or? Senator Cost, yeah. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I apologize for not putting the blue hand up. I should have done so, but I do. I'm wondering if it wouldn't be better to go ahead and get the stationary uh, monitors and all the different sites rather than trying to move some around when there's a, a situation that we could have that. I'm a little concerned about the uh, throwing a number out for saving. Uh, I think it's a good idea. We've got to cut. There's no doubt about it. But uh, boy, at the same time, I don't want to handcuff to the point where we've thrown something out that's impossible for them to meet. Yet on the other hand, if we can find a flexibility in that, it would be make some sense. But anyway, uh, right now, I would almost say we should consider the higher end price for the units so they're stationary at all the places so we don't have to say, well, that portable unit isn't at that spot. So we've either got to get it there or we're gonna have to uh, not use that uh, location for one of the telehealth. So uh, convenience seems to make more sense there and it would maybe help in that savings. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Cost. Any final comments from the committee? Okay, Representative Gray. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Yeah, I, I think, you know, let's have that debate once it gets drafted. I, I, I think that that very well could be. I think for the purposes of, of committee work, I mean, I just say, because we're in this situation. I mean, let's lean at the starting point on the bill draft and the low end, and then we have the debate when we come back and, and we can amend that up or down or, or have a debate on that. But yeah, I think that could very well be correct. But I think rather than have that the starting point, I lean towards having the lower end as the starting point, and then we work up as we, uh, as, as we debate this more. Thank you. All right, all those in favor of Representative Gray's motion to have a bill draft, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> it's, it is really hard to see. We have extra folks in and LSO staff and I don't get to see all of you all at once. So I've got to kind of scroll through the screen and some of you are raising your blue hand and some of you aren't. So I want to make sure we get this vote correctly. So all of those in favor um, of Representative Gray's motion to have LSO draft a bill um, with an appropriation to the Department of Corrections as well as the reduction in their budget. Um, and as seconded by Representative Jennings, please raise your hand and get it close to the, to the screen, to your camera so that we can all count it accurately. Okay, Ellis, I'm gonna need some help if you can. Looks like we have five in, oh no, okay. One more time, raise your hands up high, get them real close to the screen so you're almost blocking out the camera if you can. So I have Representative Stith, Representative Salazar, Representative Jennings, Representative Gray, Senator Boner, Representative Washett. I think with that, that motion has failed. Committee further discussion on this topic. Senator Anselmi Dalton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would move to approve the $95,000 funding for the two all managed unit for the Department of Corrections. Um, uh, and maybe with some caveat to say, you know, for them to document back how, what kind of savings they had by doing this. Okay, moved by Senator Anselmi Dalton, seconded by Representative Pelkey. Discussion on Senator Anselmi Dalton's motion. 
Senator Cost. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, would, would there be a possibility of considering the higher amount to uh, have those stationary units at all of the sites rather than the lower amount would be my only concern. Further discussion? Senator, or Representative Burlingame. Representative, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I, I think now might be the right place to put this comment. Um, I think we all recognize that there are going to be cuts coming up um, for corrections and uh, our vote against the former one is not to be taken in any way as um, a resistance to making necessary cuts to reflect our current budget crisis. Um, but I think that other folks probably feel like me that mental health isn't the place to do it because just from an economic perspective, we'll pay more down the road for it. Um, and that it's just as much about um, a principle of access to mental health as it is about a principle of um, economic reality that we'll pay more in the future if we, if we don't put in for it right now. So just wanted to leave that comment there. Thank you. All right, thank you, Representative. Representative Gray. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I just want to clarify the, the reduction in the previous motion was a reduction of the operating cost for the travel budget. It was not a reduction in mental health. It's a reduction on the travel costs. So I think I uh, just want to clarify what, what, what the reduction was. Thank you. Any further discussion from the committee? All that. Okay, with that, um, all those in favor of Senator Anselmi Dalton's motion uh, to direct LSO to do a bill draft with the $98,000 appropriation, um, please raise your hands. Okay, that motion has passed. All right, committee with that, um, any final discussion on this topic before we take a quick break? All right, seeing none, we'll take a break for about five minutes in light of the fact we're 40 minutes behind schedule. Um, and, and we'll see you at, at, in five minutes.
All right, if you are there but don't have your video going, if you could go ahead and make your video live so we can see if we have a quorum, that'd be helpful. Representative Washett. Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, it seemed like we left off in kind of a rush to get to our break, but we didn't discuss any funding for the courts nor funding for the jails. And I wondered if the committee might be interested in discussing either of those. Yeah, great point, Representative Washington. If there is a desire, I think there's also some time at the end of the day after we hear from the counties. Uh, I think I think uh, the County Commissioners Association, um, which represents the sheriffs and the county jails, might have some information related to that. Uh, and I think um, the court will be present here as well, but, but certainly to hear some feedback from the committee on that. So in light of the fact that you are kind of wanting to discuss things, we'll go ahead and call the meeting back to order. I do think we have a quorum now. And so we're officially um, off of break and moving forward committee. Did, were you able to hear Representative Washett's concerns that we didn't discuss any appropriations for the courts or the counties? And if there's any desire to, to do anything related to that now. Seeing none, um, but Representative Washa, why don't you just keep that in mind for later this afternoon. Um, we'll go ahead and move to the immunity issue. Uh, as the committee knows, uh, this issue was highly debated and discussed during our last special session. I think the agenda might be misleading for some of you. Um, LSO is going to provide a presentation, but there is extensive public comment that's going to be heard. Um, with a lot of ideas being presented and brought forth um, from all of the stakeholders that probably should have been involved in the initial conversation who are now going to be uh, providing public comment now. So with that, we'll go ahead and start with um, LSO um, attorney Brian Fuller, who has provided a memo and can kind of give us just kind of a broad overview as it relates to the topic. And then we will move into our public uh, comment um, the next transition being Brad Cave, attorney Brad Cave from the law firm Holland and Hart. So just giving everyone kind of a teeing up the playbook here. We'll go to Mr. Fuller and then Mr. Cave. Mr. Fuller, please proceed. Members of the committee, you should have a topic summary before you and I'll, I'll just run through, run through this in, in brief detail. Um, the, the memo starts out with just an overview of, of torts and, and how a person would be liable for a wrong that is committed against another person. And, and for purposes of the discussion here, given that willful and wanton misconduct and gross negligence are excluded from the immunity um, that was debated during the May special session, um, I focused most of the information here on negligence, on, on how a person may be liable for the negligent act or omission toward another person. Um, generally to establish that in court, you would need to show a, a duty that there was a standard of care that the person was required to hold in relation to another, that there was a breach of that duty or standard of care, um, that the breach proximately caused um, the entry to the plaintiff. And what this means is, um, it's a substantial, whatever action or omission there was, has to be a substantial factor in bringing about um, the plaintiff's injuries. Um, and then that conduct, that cause, um, cannot be, have been broken by some sort of um, intervening cause um, that, that may also prove to be a result of the injury the plaintiff suffered. Um, and then finally, the plaintiff must have indeed suffered some sort of injury as a result of, of the defendant's action. Um, as it pertains to contagious diseases and um, in light of a, a pandemic or epidemic, there are two applicable statutes that impose liability um, as it relates to the spreading of contagious disease. So first would be 35-4-109, and this imposes criminal liability, a misdemeanor, um, for any person who knowingly has, conveys, or causes to be conveyed, um, and the reference in statute is smallpox or other infectious or contagious disease. Um, 35.4.110 provides that a person who is guilty of violating 35.4.109, uh, the criminal statute I just mentioned, um, is liable in a civil action. It damages to any person who may, from that, 
cause to become infected with, with that contagious disease. Um, research revealed no case law interpreting either of these two statutes um, in, in Wyoming courts. Uh, a quick search of other states didn't reveal um, case law on similar prohibitions that those states may have. Um, the Wyoming Supreme Court has held sort of independently of these two statutes that a person who negligently exposes another to an infectious or contagious disease can be liable in damages. And in reaching that holding in part, the court cited um, a number of cases from other states that concerned the transmission of uh, tuberculosis, um, the transmission of an infection from an open wound, whooping cough and, and smallpox. Um, other states have independently recognized civil causes of action, um, civil liability for the knowing spread of an infectious or contagious disease. Those cases are um, listed on page four and footnote 13. Um, and, and then the standard for civil liability as it pertains to 354110 appears to be whether the person was or would be guilty of a violation of that criminal liability statute. Moving on to the immunity, which, which the committee should be familiar with given the, the discussion um, during the special session, 35-4-1-14. Um, and, and the memo starts out with how the statute existed before the special session. So before the special session, um, immunity from liability is provided um, during a public health emergency for any healthcare provider or other person who in good faith follows the instructions of the state health officer in responding to that public health emergency. Um, there is no immunity granted or available if there, the action or omission is considered to be gross negligence, um, which, is, which the Wyoming Supreme Court has defined and, and described as a wantonness or disregard of consequences and indifference to the rights of others. There's also no immunity for actions that are willful or, or wanton misconduct. And the court has described this as an intentional act or omission that is in reckless disregard of the consequences and under circumstances where a reasonable person would know that the conduct um, would in a high probability result in harm to another. Um, there's also a definition in a different section of public health emergency, and this is an occurrence or an imminent threat of an illness or condition caused by an epidemic or pandemic um, or a novel or highly infectious or highly fatal infectious agent. Um, under this statute, the governor declares uh, a public health emergency and must also declare when it ends um, for purposes of the applicability of this section. In the special session, um, this section was amended as part of uh, Senate File 1002 to where uh, the immunity extends to any healthcare provider or other person, including a business entity. And then the immunity applies to those persons or entities who in good faith follow the instructions of a, a, a state, county, city, town, um, health officer or who acts in good faith in responding to the public health emergency, um, that those entities or persons would be immune from any liability arising um, from complying with the instructions or acting in good faith. And then moving on Chairman Othercott, uh, members of the committee, I've also included discussion regarding um, potentially applicable constitutional provisions. So first, Article 10, Section 4 of the Wyoming Constitution provides um, that no law can be enacted to limit the amount of damages that can be recovered uh, for causing the injury or death of another person. And the court has distinguished laws that limit or curtail the amount of damages versus laws that limit um, or preclude causes of action um, from being filed in court. And then similarly, Article 1, Section 8 provides that all courts shall be open and every person um, shall be open for every person for an injury done. Um, and that person shall have justice administered without sale, denial, or delay. Um, the Supreme, the Wyoming Supreme Court has recognized this as a fundamental right, but also has stated that 
this provision does not limit the legislature from altering or abolishing causes of action so long as, as that, um, that limitation um, that is passed, that legislative action doesn't violate another uh, provision of the Constitution. A person to, to show a violation of this access to court um, has to first show a well-recognized common law cause of action that is being restricted, and second, that the restriction is unreasonable or arbitrary when balanced against the purpose and basis of the statute limiting the cause of action. Um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions um, for the committee. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. Um, remember to use your blue hand, Representative Stith, questions? You're on mute, Representative Stith. Madam Chairman, thank you. Uh, Mr. Fuller, thank you so much for your memo. I wanted to, I had a question about the scope of current civil liability when there's not a public health emergency. So under 35-4-109 and then of course 110, which is the civil version. And here's my question, and you may or may not have thoughts on it, I don't know. But when I read at the top of page three of your memo, the quotation of section 109, it's obviously it's, this is the criminal statute. The, the mens rea required here is to me uh, a bit ambiguous because if you look at one, two, three, four, five, on the fifth line down, it says, shall do any other act with intent to, comma, or necessarily tending to the spread of such disease. So the intent to, is pretty simple to understand that if you intentionally, uh, you know, spread a communicable, uh, an infectious disease, then you're, you're guilty. But because it says, or necessarily tending to the spread of such disease, and it seems like if you're doing an act which necessarily tends to the spread of such disease, you might not necessarily have to intend uh, to spread disease, or even frankly know that you are COVID-19 positive, for example. So just, just a question. I don't know that just a question to see if you have any thoughts about the mens rea element of under the existing uh, criminal statute, uh, section 109. Mr. Chairman, Fuller. Other, Chairman Othercott, Representative Stith, you know, in terms of how a court may view the terms or necessarily tending to, is I think what I understand your question to be. Um, you know, I, I imagine just at first blush, the court would look to the entire words of the statute, of that statute when interpreting that. Um, and, and it's close proximity to, you know, with intent to may inform how a court interprets that. Of course, you know, I, I, I don't want to speak for, you know, how a court may, you know, could rule on, on determining what those, you know, what those words may mean. Um, but given that there's reference to with intent to, there's reference to knowingly using permits, uh, using the premises to, um, you know, to cause or to be conveyed, uh, that that too may play a role in how those words are interpreted. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. Uh, Representative Pelkey, did you still have a question? No? All right, great. Uh, Representative Jennings. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, thank you, Brian. I have a I have a couple of questions. This one I struggled with a little bit. I, I'm not really sure I see what's broken. And so I have a couple of questions to that along those lines. One is in your research, and we we're I realize that we're very um, new to this. There's only a couple of months worth. How many cases are already being pursued? Or if, if you know of anything, any cases statewide that are being pursued under current law and two, something that we talk a lot about, but I, I'm just wondering if you could touch on the definition for us. You know, I, I've looked into this a little bit, I don't, but I'd like to have, hear your take on it. When we're talking about and using these terms, um, things like outbreak or epidemic or pandemic, if we have definitions for that, that maybe are even tied to the level of, you know, how, how many people are, are dying from this. Um, is there some definitions in there that give us, you know, what level is an outbreak, what level is an epidemic, what level it becomes a pandemic? 
And is that also is that also true against the backdrop of how many people are actually dying from this or something of that nature? Just those two things, Madam Chairman. Mr. Fuller, if you can. Chairman Heathercott, Representative Jennings, to your first question, um, I am unaware of uh, statistics regarding cases in Wyoming. Uh, I am certainly aware anecdotally of cases that have been filed in other states, but, but I don't have any number, any concrete numbers to give you um, about COVID related liability cases filed in, in Wyoming in particular. To your second question, uh, that article does not, um, I, I found no definition of what is a pandemic or epidemic. Um, so I imagine those words would be interpreted just based on their plain meaning. Um, you know, beyond that, I'm not sure I could give you, you know, what is a, you know, what is a threshold, you know, that needs to be crossed before there's a pandemic or epidemic. Um, you know, perhaps the more, the more salient point regarding that definition of public health emergency is that it must be something the governor declares and that, that begins and declares that it ends. So to that, you know, one thought maybe is that, you know, it, it would be up to the governor to decide when, whether, when there is an occurrence or imminent threat of an illness or condition that's caused by a pandemic or epidemic. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. Representative Stith. You're on mute, Representative. Madam, Madam Chairman, I apologize. I left my blue hand up by mistake. All right, great. Um, ever, is Representative Jennings follow up there? No, okay. All right, all the blue hands come down, please. Um, we're now gonna move on to uh, Mr. Cave. Mr. Cave, if you want to start your video now and your audio. Welcome to the Joint Judiciary Committee. We're, we're happy to have you here today. We're sorry we're running behind. We're about an hour behind from where I think you anticipated. Um, but go ahead and introduce yourself to the committee and um, proceed with whatever you would like to share with us this morning. Thank you, Chairman Nethercott, and thank you to the committee. My name is Brad Cave. I'm a lawyer with Holland and Hart in Cheyenne. Um, I'm here today on behalf of the Wyoming Business Alliance and its members. Um, I want to pass along the Alliance's thanks to the committee and to the legislature for the really difficult work that was undertaken during the special session. Uh, these, are, these immunity issues are very difficult to address legislatively. I know you've all grappled with the, the language in the amendment as well as um, the topic that we're going to discuss today. Uh, I, we really appreciate the opportunity you've given us to provide public comment on these topics. Uh, the Business Alliance has, has asked me to look at the changes that were made to 35-4-114 in the special session and offer some suggestions uh, to um, expand and strengthen the immunity protections that amended statute offers for Wyoming citizens and businesses. Uh, Ms. Delancey uh, distributed the text of our suggestions to you by email last evening, but before I dive into those, I want to talk about why we believe those changes are necessary. I know you are all very well aware of the realities of our circumstances as a state. You're, you, you, my guess is many of you lay awake at night worrying about those things. Um, the governor's orders, uh, the state health officer's orders, and the legislative findings that you included in, in the special session bills do a really good job of, of, of uh, explaining those challenges and explaining the, the way that COVID-19 has affected uh, our state. Um, our suggestions for this statute are intended to address the challenges of the next phase of this pandemic, and hopefully we can call it the next phase of the recovery from this pandemic. Uh, Wyoming businesses, nonprofits, and governmental entities are all preparing to take steps toward returning to the ordinary course of business, whatever that ordinary course of business will look like going forward. We don't know what that will look like in every circumstance, but we know generally it will involve more commerce, more transactions, more human contact, more interactions among people in a variety of different settings. That is by definition how the recovery will take place. 
as the restrictions relax and we are all encouraged to re-engage in the economy, Wyoming businesses and other organizations are concerned about uh, that this additional economic activity will lead to a variety of lawsuits against businesses and organizations for COVID-19 exposure. Nobody wants to expose somebody else to COVID-19. The huge majority of businesses in our state are taking proactive measures, uh, following uh, the guidelines from the state health officer, following the guidelines from the Center for Disease Control to the greatest extent they can, and working hard to reopen in a way that will be safe for their employees, as well as their customers and the other people that patronize their business or organizations. But the challenges of COVID-19 make, um, make those risks of transmission of COVID-19 very difficult to control. Uh, you can read all of the guidance that we have available to us, and none of it will tell you that if you follow these rules, you will prevent the transmission of COVID-19. Part of that uncertainty is because we don't, the, the experts don't necessarily know all the means through which it's, it's transmitted. The other issue with respect to guidance is that it changes. The guidance that we have from CDC has recently been changed to tell us that passing COVID-19 on hard surfaces may not be as, uh, as much of a risk as we originally thought, for example. The guidance we have is general uh, for, you know, every business will face um, issues in uh, applying that guidance to their specific situation. It's good guidance, it's helpful guidance, but it stops at some level of generality. Some businesses, some, care, some industries are not covered by the guidance and they have to piece together the pieces of the general guidance to apply to their, to their situations. The other aspect of running a business is employees. There is some good guidance about how to monitor employees, the questions you can ask, the data you can collect, um, you can take temperatures, there's good, good guidance on what employers can do, um, but a person can be entirely asymptomatic and carry the virus. So the questions that you ask can be honestly answered from a person who carries the virus and can infect others. Um, so a business has no way to know whether their employees and certainly not their customers, their suppliers, their delivery people uh, are, could potentially pass the infection. And unless and until we have widespread, reliable and accurate testing, uh, businesses who need to reopen will face a great risk of, con of being unable to control the passage of COVID-19 within their business. That's why we believe that immunity is necessary uh, to address this, it, it is a risk that businesses will struggle to control. They'll do their best, but their best will not prevent necessarily the spread of COVID-19 within a business or another entity. Other states are doing this, as you know. Utah adopted a broad immunity bill uh, in their special session last, last month. Five states, five other states have adopted a general immunity bill several more are considering it. The best list I could find indicates at least another five states are considering broad immunities. And 25 states have addressed uh, healthcare provider immunity through executive orders and statutes uh, specific to healthcare providers. So this is not um, a, you know, this is something that a lot of states are addressing legislatively and through executive action. Uh, lawsuits are coming. I think that we see that already in other parts of the country. I am not aware of any uh, lawsuits uh, filed in Wyoming yet. Our state court dockets are not electronically available at this time, so it would be a word of mouth or a news report to bring those to, our, to, to public attention anyway. We do know that uh, Carnival Cruise Lines, Princess Cruise Lines, and a number of long-term care facilities across the nation have been sued. Uh, there have been a variety of those lawsuits being filed already. And there have been uh, lawyers advertising for uh, clients to bring COVID-19 exposure suits in other states. Will these lawsuits be effective? One question that comes up is, isn't this gonna be hard to prove uh, for a plaintiff to prove where they caught COVID? Um, I think there are some challenges for plaintiffs to prove where they caught COVID. Uh, I think that at the end of the day, after a lawsuit runs its course, um, there's going to be difficult causation issues they're going to require medical expert testimony, et cetera, to prove. 
Um, but that's only one of the pertinent questions in deciding whether the legislature should create immunity for Wyoming businesses and organizations. Um, let me talk a little bit to illustrate that about how a lawsuit works for those of you on the committee who may not be lawyers. Um, when, when a lawsuit starts, a complaint is filed. Uh, a person who, against whom the complaint is filed, the defendant, has an option to consider whether to file a motion to dismiss that civil lawsuit. Um, when, when they file a motion to dismiss, and that would be at the outset of the lawsuit at the ver very earliest stages, when they file a motion to dismiss, the judge is required to accept every allegation on the face of that complaint as true for the purposes of deciding the motion. The judge doesn't decide whether that doesn't seem feasible. The judge doesn't decide whether, um, wow, that really couldn't even be true. The judge is required to accept the facts on the alleged in the complaint as true and examine those facts in the light most favorable to the person bringing the lawsuit. A complaint is only dis dismissed when the judge determines there's no way the plaintiff could obtain relief based on what's alleged in the lawsuit. So what this means is that um, when a lawsuit starts, unless it's deficient as a matter of law, you stand a very uphill battle as a defendant to have that case dismissed, no matter how unrealistic unreal the factual allegations might be because the judge isn't going to go behind the factual allegations to decide whether they're realistic or unrealistic, whether they, they sound true or they sound false. Judges don't do that. Um, so you can say, well, this lawsuit will never win in the long run, but the problem is the damage to the business starts when it's filed, not, not and it doesn't end until they win the lawsuit in a jury trial or a summary judgment motion after several months or several years in some cases of litigation. What happens in the meantime? The business spends money on attorney's fees, their business is disrupted, their attention is diverted from productivity to dealing with the lawsuit, their employees' privacy in these cases will be at issue as the plaintiff conducts discovery into whether the employees of the business have COVID-19. There'll be depositions to pay for, document collection, document production, medical expert fees, all of that will be incurred before the business gets its next chance to challenge the sufficiency of the evidence in the lawsuit. And all the while, there'll be pressure to settle, pressure to pay money to settle because of the costs and disruption along the way. Um, and all that has to occur before you get to a trial, before you're able to, to uh, test the evidence in front of a jury or file a summary judgment motion to test the evidence for the judge. All of those costs will be incurred uh, under the current uh, setup. Insurance coverage is another topic that I'm certain is, in, is on the mind of some of the committee members. Uh, there is a lot of debate right now about whether the standard traditional comprehensive general liability coverage will cover claims of COVID exposure. Um, there are several exclusions that might apply. Obviously, we don't have any litigation to tell us whether they apply, but insurance companies have excluded communicable diseases in some policies. They've excluded coverage for, um, for uh, things like pollution exclusions that might apply. There's bacteria and virus exclusions. Uh, policy language varies from policy to policy and company to company. And so whether coverage exists for, for claims is, is really going to be an issue that depends on the policy. Um, but even if there is coverage, there's gonna be a deductible. And depending on the business and the risk tolerance of the business, that deductible is gonna be uh, thousands of dollars to 50 or $100,000. So the specter of litigation is not the specter of losing litigation, that's part of it. The specter of litigation is the specter of litigation and the cost of defending it that we need to address um, in this statute. And that's, that's really one of the driving forces in what we are, are recommending. Current version of the statute, the questions that came up when I read it, and as I've read it over and over again, I had questions about what entities are protected and what entities are not. It says any business entity, but uh, the, that it does not address nonprofit entities. It does not address unincorporated associations. Uh, it does not address political subdivisions. So in my mind, those are examples of entities that are equally susceptible to being sued for COVID exposure. 
and that should be protected by a statutory immunity. Uh, it, it speaks in terms of, and it, the statute currently talks about what, it, what actions are protected by the immunity. The immunity uh, extends to a person following instructions um, in, in good faith, following instructions, or otherwise in good faith, uh, responding to the public health emergency. Uh, I have a couple of concerns with that language. First is the, the phrase good faith. Uh, when I first read it, I thought good faith sounds like negligence to me. It sounds like it's really not a, um, anything more than restating a negligence standard. The Wyoming Supreme Court defines good faith differently depending on the context in which it's used. But one definition of good faith that the Supreme Court has told us about is this, is this one. I'm reading directly from a Supreme Court case where they say we have defined good faith as faithfulness to an agreed common purpose and consistency with the justified expectations of the other party. It excludes a variety of types of conduct characterized as involving bad faith because they violate community standards of decency, fairness, or reasonableness. So if good faith is to be determined by a community standard of reasonableness, um, then a business's compliance with instructions in good faith or taking good faith steps to respond to the pandemic um, is really simply, did they do so reasonably in, in the basis of a community standard? Um, that's all well and good, except that the community standard uh, is not defined in, in this context and, need, and the good term of good faith adds ambiguity to defining that. The second part of the statute, um, which you have to consider in conjunction with good faith is the, uh, is the last sentence of section, subsection A, which says that the, uh, the immunity shall not apply to acts or omissions constituting gross negligence or willful or wanton misconduct. So I think when you consider all those terms together, I think the good faith standard, although I understand it may have been intended to create a safe harbor, I think it opens the door to arguments that what it really means is a negligence, a simple negligence standard, not a safe harbor. Uh, it doesn't work in favor of the business. It works in favor of the plaintiff who can argue that the business should have done something as a matter of good faith, even though good faith may not be defined in the, in the guidance uh, or in the statute. Uh, another question I had is what does the statute mean when it says responding to a public health emergency? It protects people who are acting in good faith when they're responding to a public health emergency. Does that protect a person who uh, is conducting business in the ordinary course in the same way that they would have before the public health emergency. Um, and so there's, I, I, when you qualify good faith with responding to the public health emergency, it, it leads to questions about what actions are we talking about uh, within the scope of responding to the public health emergency. And then finally, the burden um, of the statute doesn't tell us who has the burden to prove that a business was not acting in good faith. Is good faith a burden on affirmative defense that the business has to prove, or is the lack of good faith an element of the plaintiff's case? So when I read the statute, as I thought about what the statute is intended to do, um, I felt that the only thing the plaintiff would need to do to, to pursue litigation through the entire process and to really undermine a substantial purpose of the immunity was to plead the basic conclusions uh, that they were exposed at a business, that the business was grossly negligent or willful and wanton or failed to take good faith steps to protect them, uh, and that the business should be liable for their damages. Basic conclusions in a pleading, uh, I think, would, under the statute as it is today, um, could get a person beyond the pleading phase and require a business to defend that case through trial. So we've offered some suggestions to the language um, and I realize you, you may not have had an opportunity yet to review those in detail, but I, I wanna just cover the key points of our suggestions. Um, first, we, we've expanded and defined who's covered by, by the immunity to define the term any person or entity. And we provided a, a definition. That definition, is there's nothing special about it. I uh, tried to be inclusive of all of the entities that seem to me to be 
within the policy of protecting um, under the immunity. Uh, we've tried to make it pandemic neutral. Uh, I've rephrased the immunity language to apply to any public health emergency declared by the governor um, so that the, you know, the public health emergency as, as, um, as the LSO memo tells us, it has a start date and an end date. Um, and, and so this statute would apply anytime the governor declares a public health emergency. We've ex retained the exclusion from the immunity for those who act with gross negligence or willful or wanton misconduct. Those are phrases and standards that the Wyoming Supreme Court has defined on many occasions. Um, they, they have some, some ambiguity in and of themselves, um, particularly gross negligence, but because they are defined and used multiple times in the tort context, in the context of negligence cases, personal injury cases, malpractice cases, in those contexts, um, there's definitions that are more easily applicable than good faith, for instance, which is usually used in a commercial context. We've also included a requirement uh, in, in our suggestion that the plaintiff be required to make specific allegations of the acts or omission that caused the exposure. In other words, they can't simply allege, I was exposed at your business. Um, they have to say how the exposure occurred. They have to make specific allegations about that exposure, how it occurred, so that the business has an opportunity to challenge that um, exposure uh, at the earliest stage of the lawsuit. And then we, we included a, uh, a clear and convincing standard of proof. Clear and convincing standards of proof uh, appear lots of times in Wyoming statutes and Wyoming common law. They're used, that standard is used in a variety of settings. For instance, um, uh, a licensing board has to prove uh, disciplinary action by a clear and convincing standard in order to deprive a person of their professional license. Fraud has to be proven by clear and convincing evidence in under Wyoming common law. So there are a variety of ways that um, the clear and convincing standard uh, is used, usually in conjunction with a strong policy reason. And I think that this pandemic, this public health emergency provides that strong policy reason where a clear and convincing uh, burden of proof is, is appropriate. Um, finally, um, we included a provision to limit the application of this statute to acts and omissions that occurred within the period of the public health emergency. That gives it sort of an implied sunset date. Uh, it ends when the governor says it ends. Um, and therefore, the things that a business does that have the protection of the immunity are confined within that time period. And then uh, finally, the effective date provides some degree of retroactive application. Uh, only again within that scope of the public health emergency. Um, so those are our suggestions. I know I ran through those quickly. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Mr. Cave, thank you very much. Um, I do wish that this information would have been provided ahead of time so we could have had it publicly available with our meeting materials so the public could have had an opportunity to review these proposed changes. Um, do you have any objection to us making that publicly available here even after the meeting? Absolutely not, Madam Great. Chairman. I mean, so I would just ask that our LSO team be able to um, make that available. I just, one of the hardest conversations we've had on this topic is it's big, it's robust, it has um, significant implications, not only as it relates to this pandemic, but I think um, in access to the courthouse in general moving forward. and. Public input, I think, is critically important. So we have the greatest minds in the state really looking at it as opposed to just always a handful of us um, addressing this. A, a couple of things, um, just a quick question for you. I know you added into the definitions and I'm sure this is in response to panic um, by those entities, but you've limited um, who it applies to as it relates to only county and municipal political subdivisions and special districts. One, do you believe that government, governmental uh, immunity applies to all of our government entities across the state as opposed to now we have separated out maybe state entities being subject to liability as opposed to carving them out here? So I'm really concerned about that. Um, 
And two, how do you think that this particular proposed change will uh, limit businesses' cost in defending against a lawsuit since they still have very similar standards? And it's not very clear when that immunity would apply anyway. Madam Chairman, um, in response to your first question, uh, I didn't. I did not leave the state out of that, or state agencies and departments out of the definition for any particular purpose. Uh, I, I think, as you think about the spectrum of political subdivisions that we have now, primary in my mind was um, was trying to avoid parsing through the Governmental Claims Act to determine which political subdivisions might be liable under which sorts of scenarios. I thought it was easier to do it as a blanket. Uh, a blanket uh, inclusion, if you will, the state could be added in there. I don't, and, and the university could be added in there. I don't have any strong feelings about that uh, from from my perspective of how the statute would operate. Um, with respect to your second question, um, the intent of the of the language that we added to the end of subsection A, uh, any complaint shall specifically describe such acts or omissions and such acts or omissions must be proven by clear and convincing evidence. The first part of that phrase is intended to um, establish a pleading standard that, uh, that businesses can challenge against um, the scope of the immunity. In other words, even if everything judge, these, even if the judge takes everything that's pled as true, which they must, we're not attempting to change that, those acts or omissions must be specifically pled and the judge can say yes under the standards of gross negligence or willful and wanton misconduct as already defined by our Supreme Court, those acts and omissions do not qualify as gross negligence or willful and wanton misconduct. I think it, it provides a vehicle for a much more um, robust review of the allegations that are made in a complaint at the pleading phase, at the at the motion to dismiss phase, that's my hope, and we're balancing that against not closing the door to the courthouse for valid claims. So you have to find a place where invalid claims can be tested earlier in the process, and that's my that's the effort there. Representative Stith. Madam Chairman, thank you, Mr. Cave. Thank you very much for your presentation and the proposed draft. Uh, I do have some concerns. I'm concerned both that your proposed draft language is both too broad and too narrow at the same time. It seems like what you've done is you've eliminated any role for instructions from the state health officer to play any role in determining whether immunity should apply or not. And by doing that, you've eliminated the safe, you would eliminate the safe harbor. Uh, so for example, here in Sweetwater County, under the draft legislation just passed a couple weeks ago, or under the legislation passed a couple weeks ago, the county health officer here is promulgating specific rules applicable to the uh, hospitality industry. And that's useful for the hospitality industry because then they know if they do these specific things, like if they disinfect the counter or whatever the instructions might be, that gives them a nice safe harbor and gives them a certain certainty. Whereas your draft is much broader and would just limit acts to gross negligence. So the so that's one area. My second question, and I'll stop talking, is you've made the burden of proof clear and convincing evidence, and uh, I wanted to find out why you thought that was appropriate. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman, Representative Stiff. Uh, as I said earlier, when I read the statute as amended, I did not see the good faith language as a safe harbor, and I I I don't believe after reading it over and over again that it would operate as such. Um, and I also am concerned that the safe harbor is tied to compliance with guidelines and instructions. Uh, the guidelines and instructions are necessarily general. They don't extend to the specific activities within a particular business. Uh, for Let me give you an example. I'm reading from Dr. Harris's uh, May 27th um, order relating to schools, colleges, restaurants, bars, etc. cetera. Um, this is on page three. It's... Uh, subsection, well, it's part of the order. Uh, it says physical distance, this is about restaurants, physical distancing guidelines must be maintained while customers enter and remain on premises. Okay, great. Excellent policy level statement, uh, consistent with CDC guidance, um, everything we've been hearing about physical distancing. 
okay, what is the, what is the restaurant's um, obligation to enforce that? If a customer walks in, uh, sees their, their friends across the way, walks over, stands at their table for five minutes talking to their friends, does the restaurant have an obligation to ask that patron to move, to go to their table, to not stand up and walk around the restroom? The, all of that question, you can say this is the rule, but the, the challenge will be when a plaintiff says, well, so and so, this restaurant allowed this patron to come and visit me at my table and nobody did anything to stop them. Well, okay, is that the restaurant's liability under the, have they now stopped following the instructions in good faith? because they did not take steps to enforce in that particular situation. On the next page of the order, there's a couple of additional examples. Uh, subsection P on page four of the same order talks about screening employees for symptoms. I think that's a great idea. Um, federal law and the guidance from the EEOC allows employers to do that. Um, and and the, the basic guidance has been incorporated in this, in this order. The question is, how do you screen? Do you do it simply by asking questions of the employee? Do you take the employee's temperature? Um, do you do it once a day, twice a day, three times a day? Uh, what, what temperature degree is, um, is the cutoff? Uh, you know, the CDC at one point said 100.4 is the cutoff. And if you're over that, you need to go home until some other events happen. So, you know, is that gonna change? So how you implement your employee screening program is not addressed specifically in the order. Um, cash handling, payment handling, says the business shall encourage contactless and non-signature payment. I totally agree, great idea. Um, what does that mean exactly? And the various methods I've seen in my own transactions include things like passing the uh, you know, passing a plastic bucket with the with the change back and forth, and doing things to avoid physical contact, but you're still touching the same money. Um, you know, and so all of those things are things that aren't covered by uh, the instructions. And so, when when do you move from following instructions to deciding what's best in your own business? And the and how does the good faith um, apply after that? The, the good faith leaves the statute in our version and it's replaced by just blanket immunity unless you're grossly negligent or you have willful and wanton behavior. So the instructions are certainly part of a defending that claim. Those instructions will still be critical to, to defending a claim um, and compliance with those instructions will still, I think, have a very substantial benefit for businesses, but they don't define the scope of the immunity under our version, our suggested version of the statute. Um, the second part that you question you asked was on the clear and convincing st standard. Uh, and I'm gonna summarize this and I realize that this is a general summary and, but under Wyoming law, the clear and convincing standard is used where there are constitutional issues or strong policy issues, why um, something should have to be proven by a higher standard of evidence, a higher quality of evidence, than the mere preponderance of evidence that most civil cases are, are used in. Um, fraud is the one I mentioned before. Taking away somebody's professional license is another one. Um, there are, I think the clear and convincing standard appears 70 to 100 times in Wyoming statutes. So it's a, it's a well-developed statute, it's, there's a well-developed standard. Because of the things I talked about at the beginning where um, because this disease the fact that people can be asymptomatic, the fact that they can be asymptomatic and not have the disease on day one, and on day three, they can be asymptomatic and, be, and have the disease. Uh, the fact that a business you know, can't know from day to day necessarily who's coming into their business and whether they're infected, all of those reasons, I think, create a policy environment in, during the midst of this public health emergency that justifies a clear and convincing standard of proof if somebody's gonna to try to claim that they received COVID-19 due to infection by going to church or by going to a meeting of the Rotary Club or by going to uh, have dinner at a local restaurant. Those things all ought to be, that ought to be a clear and convincing standard under these circumstances. And it's a policy judgment. And, and I, I know that's not my judgment to make, but I suggested that it's a judgment that the legislature should consider. 
Mr. Cade, real briefly, I think it's a good opportunity. Can you quickly explain, which has never really come up in any of these conversations, which is also disappointing, which is a comparative fault in Wyoming? Just real briefly, and then we're going to go to Senator Von Fildern. Sure. Wyoming has a comparative fault statute that is that basically requires a jury to decide the relative fault of all of the actors who contribute to a person's harm, including the plaintiff's um, contribution to their own harm. And a jury uh, at the end of the day will be asked to fill out a verdict form and all of the actors and parties um, will be assigned a percentage of the total fault. Um, and depending on the circumstances of the case, if a certain amount is, a, is attributed to the plaintiff, the plaintiff is no longer able to recover uh, and it, it, you know, it, can, it has a lot of permutations beyond that. So if a plaintiff is found to have ha be responsible for their own harm to a degree greater than 50%, they have no recovery, is that right? So if, so if an individual doesn't wear their face mask, doesn't use hand sanitizer, walks out of their home <laughs> and exposes themselves to the virus, comparative fault will be measured by a court even um, and determine whether or not liability attaches. That's, that's right, uh, by a jury usually. I mean, I don't think judges make comparative fault decisions, but juries do. All right, thank you. Senator Von Flatern. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, Mr. Cave, you start out by saying during a public health emergency. So what if the governor declares this emergency over in a couple months? and 10 days later, somebody is sick and they say, I got it at work. Can they still sue? Or will the employer not be, um, the employer itself would not have immunity? Uh, Madam, Madam Chairman, uh, this, this immunity statute really doesn't affect the employer's workers' compensation immunity. So if it's an employee claiming they caught it at work, uh, the legislature has already addressed that, um, in, and that would be presumed to be a workplace injury, and they, that employee would receive uh, workers' comp benefits for that, and they would be unable to sue their employer under the exclusive remedy provision in Title 27 uh, in the Workers' Comp Act. So let's say if we change up your scenario a little bit, just to say it was a customer who comes in and and... 10 days after the public health emergency is declared over and says, I was there, I caught COVID-19 at that time. Um, I think that's an excellent question. I used the public health emergency duration simply because it was a hard beginning and a hard end, a, a date certain. Um, I, I think under the definitions of public health emergency, before the governor would declare it to be uh, concluded, there would, uh, my belief would be that there would be a, a confidence level on the part of the state, state health officer and the governor that the spread of the disease was at a manageable level or that for some reason or another, it, the disease was not at the, uh, of the same risk that it was during the public health emergency. So I, I, <laughs> I punted that issue to some extent simply by relying on the experts that would make that decision. Uh, Representative Stith, back to you. Uh, Madam Chairman, I apologize. I left my blue hand up by mistake. Sorry. And Senator Von Flatern, anything else from you? Okay, great. So, so Mr. Cave, I didn't quite get satisfaction to my question, and I'm and I'm very much concerned about this. And I'm also going to direct the question to LSO and provide my own legal opinion on the process. It is my opinion that the contraction of COVID from a government entity does not result in liability to the government entity. And stated another way, that governments, all governments, special districts to the state have governmental immunity protections associated with the contraction of COVID. Your thoughts? Madam Chairman, um, I, I think the governmental immunity statute uh, excludes from the immunity uh, malpractice in the provision of medical care. Uh, so I, I see that as a fairly significant uh, gap in the governmental immunity under the Governmental Claims Act. And, you know, a variety of particularly our rural hospitals and rural clinics 
our public political subdivisions. It's covered by the Governmental Claims Act, yet subject to this broad um, gap in their immunity. Yeah, Mr. Cave, I'm just going to follow up and go to Mr. Fuller. I think you're right that so all the government entities, so the Secretary of State's office or your local polling center, if people go in and contract the virus there, they are immune from liability. There is the exception for medical providers, whether they're state employed or government employed versus private employed, are exposed to liability still. So you're right in that caveat exception, one of those six exceptions, um, the providing of health care is not protected by governmental immunity. So I do think that needs to be addressed, but but that's it. Mr. Fuller, your thoughts as well? Chairman Othercott, uh, members of the committee, Governmental Claims Act, um, first off, the definition of governmental entity includes not only the state, but also county and local entities um, and all political subdivisions of the state, I believe is the, is the language used in the definition of the Government Claims Act. Um, it flatly says that it, except for six separate statutory sections, a governmental entity is not liable in tort, um, ex except for those actions. One of those is um, health, the provision of, I believe, healthcare or medical services. Um, and I believe the word used in that statute is negligent, um, that it would be the negligent provision of care that would uh, render a governmental entity liable. Representative Stith. Madam Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Cave, while you, we have you here, I thought I might ask your opinion on a slightly different topic. It relates to 35-4-109, which is the current criminal statute, which appears to have been drafted in an era of smallpox. And my basic question is, do you think the statute needs to be updated? Mr. Cave? Madam Chairman, Madam Chairman Representative Stiff, um, probably I have not spent as much time looking at that statute. Uh, and I don't have any concrete recommendations, but I did get the sense that it that it was an, an aged statute, if you will, and and um, probably could stand some some updating. It the fact that they're the two are tied together, the criminal statute and the civil statute are tied together, uh, is is kind of unique, I think, um, and may not really fit uh, the circumstances very well. But I I don't want to I don't want to tell you I have a reasoned opinion on that question because I don't. Any final questions from Mr. Cave before we move on to our next speaker, who will be Eric Boley from the Wyoming Hospital Association? Okay, Mr. Cave, stay on. Um, don't you don't get to leave yet unless you have to, of course. I do see Miss Delancey um, was on as well. I don't know from the Wyoming Business Alliance if she would like to speak now. I think you're together, I, I believe. Give a minute there. Do you know if Miss Delancey was intending to speak? Madam Chairman, I believe she was, um, but only uh, only generally in an in, in introductory fashion. I, she may still want to, I don't know. Welcome, Ms. Delancey, I see you. Hi, welcome to the committee. If you'd just introduce yourself briefly and, and let us know any of your thoughts. Certainly, thank you, Madam Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, I know that this has been a lengthy discussion already, uh, so I don't want to um, pile on or, or you know say repeat things that have already been addressed, but. Um, it was my hope uh, to bring um, you know, Mr. Cave uh, on the team to this discussion to help the committee uh, come up with you know, some potential options from the business perspective. You know, it's, as we talked about, it's a very delicate balance. And as we are learning more and more through your work uh, with the business interruption grant, the majority of our businesses in Wyoming are small businesses. They don't have HR departments. They don't have lawyers on retainer they're very, very concerned right now about how this is gonna play out. I mean, even just this discussion with Mr. Cave, my, my, my head is going places that I'm like, ah, you know, flipping out. But Mr. Cave deals with these facts and scenarios for Wyoming businesses every day. This is the primary focus of his practice. And that's why I thought, you know, the members of the Business Alliance, as well as the entire business community would be well suited to get his take on how we might be able to um, you know, continue on with the excellent work that was uh, put forth by the legislature during this special session in a very compressed and um, fast time, time pace. But as we can see, the nuances of this statute are so important to get it right. 
because adjusting one word, one clause, one, one period can really um, you know, change the way that these, these matters will be interpreted in front of a court and, and ultimately in front of a jury. And uh, I just bring to you that, you know, that we've come up with some solutions. We'd love to continue to um, work with the committee. We would ask that you would take action on uh, adopting the recommendations put forth by Mr. Cave as, as a you know, continuation of the discussion and the good work that's been going on, because this is an extremely important topic for Wyoming businesses right now. And I, I know you all recognize that, but especially for those small businesses that are desperately trying to reopen. You know, Wyoming business people, we all wanna do the right thing, but under, you know, under these, the, these times, knowing what that is, is very, very hard. And the notion of trying to do the right thing, having you know to defend yourself in a very very expensive lawsuit, thinking you're doing the right thing, and end up finding out that you didn't do the right thing, that's extremely concerning to many of my members. So, just want to thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, again, you know we offer up the expertise of Mr. Cave uh, to help as this committee continues to work through this very tricky issue and stand uh, willing and ready to be a partner in this discussion. So thank you, Madam Chairman. Ms. Delancey, thank you so much. Any questions for Ms. Delancey? Uh, Senator Anselmi Dalton. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, thank you, uh, Ms. Delancey. And obviously um, your work, I, I, I commended it already. I um, The one thing I have seen and I'm working on personally myself is working with our health officer right now um, for the hospitality industry to say, here's some standards, here's some specific guidelines, which is the trouble that um, Mr. Cave had was that, you know, it wasn't always specific enough. How do you interpret it? The ones I am drafting are, are very, very specific for hotels. So how do you feel about leaving in the immunity kind of, if you're in good faith, following the uh, directives of the either state or the local health officer where, you know, we work with them to sort of make it more specific. I, I understand his concerns, but how would you feel about that? Ms. Delancey? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Senator Anselmi Dalton. I see your point on that. However, I go back to the point raised by Mr. Cave. You know, it would, I think it would be unreasonable to expect our county state health officers to be developing protocols for every single business sector in Wyoming. You know, I just, I draw from my own experience, you know, with my husband's business. We produce rodeo events. You know, I, I, there's not a lot of guidance out there on how you have to properly social distance and disinfect. And you know, when you're when you're handling uh, you know cattle, you know, we're trying to do everyone the brandings. Everybody's doing the best they can when they're farming. So if we want to you know kind of drill down and create the resources available that will have that the expectation will be that our county health officers will be able to customize these types of plans for every business sector that we have in Wyoming, um, that might be, you know, an option. However, with budget cuts and, you know, resource issues, I, I'm not sure that's feasible. And so that's where coming back to, you know, sort of more of that blanket, high level, generalized immunity that Mr. Cave has set forth seems to be maybe a better fit for particularly some of those very, very specialized businesses um, that might have some very unique practices that, you know, maybe the health officer is not aware of or fully understands. So I would opt for the more uh, generalized as opposed to specific. Thank you. Follow up, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, Senator. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. And yeah, Cindy, I think I appreciate all the work you have done. I, I agree with it, but I think it doesn't have to be either or. I think it can be both. I think, um, you know, Janessa Meredith is working with me here also to say, hey, can we work on this for museums and make it sort of more general for small businesses and things like that. Because I think that's obviously what you want to protect and I want to protect as well. And um, we're doing it where it's very specific, you know, and not making it outrageously burdensome on the business either. And maybe you wouldn't fall in that. Maybe you wouldn't have rules for your, your what some businesses wouldn't have rules, but a lot of our small businesses could be covered and follow the uh, orders of the health officers, as long as we make sure they're sort of tailored. And I see the problems that there are, but I, I would hope we could get your support say it doesn't have to be either or that could be both perhaps. Would you support that? Ms. Delancey? Thank you, Madam Chairman. I absolutely look forward to continuing the discussion. And if there is some way to ensure that we're not too prescriptive 
and have that um, you know sort of middle ground have both again and, and I, I certainly didn't mean to suggest that a, you know an either or are only two options we can certainly continue to have the discussion and work on some kind of hybrid but you know I just I just really harken back to the points that Mr. Cave you know raised that as you know his example of as somebody walks out of turn at the restaurant to talk to their friend does that now trigger that you're not following the orders and that you're you know that you're engaging in conduct that could be dangerous or risky to your public you know so how as long as we find that appropriate balance which i look at the the you know the talent on this committee and i have full full faith that you all will come up with some very um you know creative uh, solutions on how to manage some of these very very difficult policy choices that are out there you know my goal simply was to raise the issue with you try to find some solutions and continue the conversation so that as we do work on moving towards the next phase of reigniting our economy that people have some certainty about what they should be doing as they try to get themselves and their their employees back to work to to keep our economy in wyoming going so thank you our representative wash it Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, that testimony just, and, and the question by the Senator and Sammy Dalton raised a question in my mind, is having a very prescriptive, detailed, step-by-step, -step, you know, A through Z listing of responsibilities uh, advantageous for business? Uh, maybe Mr. Cave could answer that. Or is that perhaps going to expose more business and a more general prescription of what they should be doing and ought not be doing? Ms. Delancey, if you can. Certainly, and uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I'd be happy to defer to, to Mr. K, but that, that's kind of my point exactly, is if we start, you know, I, I certainly, you know, this is where this delicate balance comes in if we want some certainty, but if we, we pin ourselves down too much, especially as guidance is changing. You know, we've seen, as Mr. Cave said, you know, the virus lives on surfaces for X amount of time. No, we've learned more. Maybe that's not quite right. You know, I, I mean, things are just constant. It's a moving target right now. And um, I, I definitely, you know, as, as an attorney myself, I could sure see, you know, the, the challenge of having something so prescriptive in the event that something isn't followed to the absolute T. But at the same time, you know, leaving the door wide open isn't advantageous either. So I'd, I'd ask, you know, maybe if there's any follow up from Mr. Cave on this, Madam Chairman, if time allows. Absolutely, Mr. Cave, if you're there listening, if not, we can come back to you. Feel free to just put your video on if you'd like to come forward now. I'm disabled. <laughs> you're actually, we there can we go. There you are. <laughs> there we go. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman, uh, Representative Washett. Uh, standards, rules, no matter where they come from, can always be used as a sword or a shield in litigation. Uh, if you comply with them, you use them as a shield and you say, look, we complied with the standard. If you uh, make decisions, uh, even, in, even well thought out, well reasoned, responsible decisions to depart from the standard or to move beyond the standard, uh, the, the standard can be used to argue that you didn't comply, therefore you're liable. So you, you, your question raises a very good point. The more detailed the standards, the more the compliance burden uh, will be felt by the business, um, even if the standard are, standards are well-meaning and, and positive. And the more difficult it'll be for businesses to, um, to extrapolate to those situations that are not specifically covered by the standard. All right, thank you, Mr. Cave. Thank you, Mr. Cave, Mr. Lancey, appreciate having you here. Now we're gonna go, oh, Representative Gray has a question. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, yeah, I wanna ask a question about this more generalized approach in the wording of the statute as opposed to Bill 1005 drafted by uh, Senators Kinski and uh, Representative Cass in the special session. And I'm not advocating one way or another on this, okay? I just want to understand that that you fully thought about it and what, what your thoughts are on this. Going with this generalized approach, I mean, I, I just kind of think about a year, hopefully less than that, once there's a vaccine, at some point the, the, the emergency is going to, the, the order is going to go away, okay? And there's going to be a vaccine. 
there will still probably be some transmission. Like there's a flu vaccine and there's transmission of the flu. And so under this wording, it, the immunity would not apply anymore as opposed to the approach in 1005 on the House and Senate side from the special session where I think it would. And I think that's a pretty big change. So I was just wondering if you've contemplated that and uh, if you agree with my interpretation of this, of what this means, this new approach. Thank you. Mr. Boley, I promise we're gonna to get to you sometime. <laughs> but if you wanna put your camera on now so we can deal with that transition later, bought you some time, Mr. Cave, Ms. Delancey, whenever you're ready to answer that question. I'm happy to take a shot at that if uh, Madam Chairman, if, unless Mr. Lancey wants to do that. I'm on mute. <laughs> Madam Chairman, uh, Representative Gray, um, I, I agree with Representative Gray's reading of, of uh, SF 1005. It is not time limited uh, in, in the text of the bill as introduced. Um, a couple of thoughts about that. It, it also uh, would not have begun effect, it would not have become effective until uh, everything, you know, all the acts necessary to make it a law um, were, were accomplished, which would have placed its, its timing of its effective period later. It would have extended beyond the end of the public health emergency or, or stated better, there's nothing in the public health there's nothing in SF-1005 that stops the effectiveness of this. Um, it has a different scope of immunity as well. It's, it's more of a premises-based immunity, uh, which um, would raise challenges for delivery companies, uh, plumbers, you know, craftsmen that go to people's homes or people's businesses off of their own premises. So there are some differences in our immunity under our suggestion compared to 1005. Um, as well, but I agree the timing issues, uh, the, the timing of both proposals or both suggestions is different. All right, thank you both again. We're gonna now switch to Mr. Boley from the Hospital Association. Mr. Boley, please introduce yourself to the committee and uh, we're happy to hear from you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Chairman Kirkbride committee members. I'm Eric Bully with the Wyoming Hospital Association and Leading Age Wyoming. And we've been working closely with the, the Business Alliance and with Mr. Cave too on the proposed changes and, and draft language. Um, but I, I just had some comments because I think this is a, a very important topic um, when we look at, at the healthcare. Um, you know, these are unprecedented times and, and who would have guessed that when we were finished up our legislative session we, we would be facing what we would. We went immediately from that legislative session right into COVID. Um, the, the emergency was declared on March 13th. Um, medical providers, hospitals, nursing homes across the state, they made immediate changes in the way that the care was delivered. And a lot of times that was done without really clear guidance. Suggestions, guidance, and protocols changed daily, if not hourly. Uh, hospitals and nursing homes adapted quickly and have done all they can to conform to CDC, CMS, HHS, and state directives. Medical providers and other staff members have sacrificed much to protect the health and lives of those they serve. These same providers have put their own health and lives on the line to serve others. Oftentimes, they've had to isolate themselves from their families so they wouldn't take the virus home and infect their loved ones. Our nursing homes in the state have bucked the trends. Um, as we look at the, the spread of coronavirus or COVID-19 across the country, uh, it's deadly in long-term care facilities and our nursing homes have done all they can and have bucked the trends. We've had very few uh, confirmed cases in our nursing homes and, and uh, the, the death rate is, is minimal. Healthcare providers have become infected through the course of their jobs. PP, PPE has been limited and at times almost impossible for us to uh, to, to get. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of our businesses are going to face here in the future. Um, our country was not prepared for the pandemic when it hit. The state and national stockpiles were not sufficient for a pandemic. And what we've found is that um, outside countries have started gouging in prices 
and have gobbled up a lot of the supply of those PPEs. And so even our ability sometimes to protect those that are on the front lines has been difficult because PPE has been so difficult to come by. Um, recommendations and guidelines have changed as, um, as the pandemic has progressed and new things are learned each day that may change protocol from the previous day. We've had to find creative ways to be able to staff, often using traveling staff and volunteers to care for the sick. I'm honored and consider myself blessed to represent hospitals and nursing homes. These entities, which are comprised of their incredible staff and, hero, are, and staff are heroes. Those heroes live amongst us. We're asking for you to favorably consider the proposed changes to the legislation um, and uh, encourage you to take a look at the, the proposed language. Uh, we're willing to be held responsible uh, for those things which we can control, gross negligence and, and the other things that we've discussed. But with the pandemic, um, the playing field changes daily. And as Mr. Cave told you, there's 25 other states that have adopted some form of immunity uh, to, pr to provide coverage for healthcare providers. Um, we would ask that we have the same protections here in our state that we, so that we can continue to serve those that need our help. And with that, I'd answer any question. Questions for Mr. Boley? I would, I would just like to add kind of an interesting comment, and I am compelled by the 25 other states providing protection, protections, but I, I have just uniquely felt it um, interesting that in the 80s, the legislature passed the current immunity um, language and statute associated with medical providers in response to a health emergency. And so just kind of a unique piece, and I hope we get credit for that, that Wyoming actually does have something on the books concerning this, and we were proactive even then, although I don't know exactly why we did that in the 80s, but we did. And I, I just hope we get recognized for that good work, even though we're not uh, immediately doing so much now, but, but we did act in the last special session too. So I hope we're counted in the 25. Well, and you know, <laughs> Madam Chairman, we, we, we faced a lot of these different challenges over the years. There was uh, the bird flu, swine flu, um, there was SARS. Um, we got uh, reoccurrence of some of the, the diseases that we thought we eradicated. And so I, I don't think this will be the last time that we face something like this. I hope it is. But uh, yeah, the, the, the foresight in the 80s was great. And, and so, yeah, you get credit for that for sure. <laughs> well, kudos to them. Co-Chairman Kirkbride. Thank you, Madam Co-Chairman. And Mr. Bowley, just to confirm, the legislation is proposed by Mr. Cave that serves your purposes of the people you represent? Madam Chairman, Chairman Kirkbride, yes, we, we've worked closely with them and we, we think that it's a, it's a good compromise and good language that would give us the protection we need. Thank you. All right, anyone else for Mr. Boley? We do have a couple others for public comment. We're now going to turn to uh, Ms. Marsha Shaner from the Wyoming Trial Lawyers Association. Marsha, if you wanna turn on your video and then with that, I'm also going to have Mr. Um, we have one more public comment after Ms. Shaner, Mr. Michael Duff. I'm going to have him turn on his video as well, just so that we get all those kinks worked out. We're able to hear this testimony pretty timely. So uh, Ms. Shaner, please welcome, introduce yourself to the committee. We know you, uh, but we're happy to hear your comments today. Good morning. I guess it's afternoon, barely. Madam Chairman and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to talk with you today. This is always, a, I think, a challenging topic because it requires looking at um, both sides, which I don't think we've mentioned the fact that we also have customers and clients and consumers and Wyoming citizens who are now going into our businesses and want to make sure that their health and safety are being considered while they're helping to reopen the economy. I think it will take them feeling comfortable to get us out and wanting to go eat and get our hair cut and um, to welcome our tourists to our communities. Um, 
we were and I'll remain comfortable with the special legislation that you all worked on during the special session. I appreciate the efforts that you, Madam Chairman, made in the conference committee. And in the numbers of states who passed legislation, Wyoming is definitely counted. So you can feel good about that in, in the, uh, the numbers that, that I have. Um, I wish we would have had a little bit of an opportunity to review Mr. Cave's proposed language. It's a pretty big change from what you all passed in SF-1002. It um, now provides blanket immunity. It raises the standard from a preponderance of the evidence to clear and convincing. And um, so that um, is a little bit concerning that we have, haven't seen it. Um, we're in the midst of a public health emergency. You all addressed that um, with your grant of immunity. The way that my folks read this, any healthcare provider is already covered. And I agree with Mr. Boley, they are heroes and I appreciate them very much. Um, any other person is covered, any business entity is covered. Um, and that covered states that they're immune from any liability for either complying with the instructions or just for acting in good faith. There is that good faith at the very end of um, that one sentence. So if you are acting in good faith, you are immune. Um, so good faith um, is uh, one of two avenues for immunity. Um, so, um, and we too, you know, good faith is a uh, term that has many definitions. I've looked it up too in the Wyoming statutes that it has many definitions. Um, but we are concerned that messing around with the standards of proof and prescribing what judges and juries will determine is overreaching. So changing to clear and convincing evidence, especially when the plaintiff is already only in the change that Mr. Cave is suggesting is their only avenue is for will, willful and wanton behavior. So they already are going to have a pretty high hurdle. Um, Let's see, I, and we agree, or I think it's been stated that proving causation is going to be pretty difficult. And as you noted, we have comparative fault. So the fault of any of me, as I go into our post office and how I deal with people in the post office, whether I went to the post office before I went to Las Fuentes, which is down the street, the restaurant, whether I did any one of a, a number of things is going to be used when or if, which I find very highly unlikely, a case is filed. Um, so it's gonna be very difficult to prove causation. And the door isn't wide open for lawsuits. Um, I think I understand the concern. We, we truly understand, which is why we've um, supported the um, language that you all adopted during your special session. We want businesses to feel comfortable. We want them to open. We want our communities to thrive again, but we also want our citizens' constitutional rights to remain protected. We want them to know that when they go into your business, you are following guidelines and that you are taking care to protect their health and safety. We feel like you have responded in a positive way and have provided a bit of a balance. The end point, which is the end of the emergency is a positive thing. I think we'll be able to see if this statute, these changes, whatever they may wind up to be have actually worked. And we can consider whether we need to do something different um, after that. So I think if you make um, some of the changes that have been suggested today, you're going to kind of tip the balance. Well, I don't think kind of, you are going to tip the balance towards blanket immunity for business without much consideration for the customers and clients who enter those businesses. While I know business wants to do the right thing, we want to, to let our people know that they are doing the right thing. So, um, 
I think if you make these changes, we'll lose the balance that you struck during your special session. And I'd be happy to try and answer questions. As you know, I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> which is sad for you today. Um, you have Michael Duff um, following me, who is a very um, knowledgeable lawyer who can maybe address some of your questions. I have lawyers on standby if I um, can uh, if I need to um, ask some questions of them. So thank you, Madam Chairman. And I appreciate the committee's work very much. This is a tough topic, I know. Well, thank you, Ms. Shaner. It looks like we do have a question from Representative Gray. Representative Gray. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Ms. Shaner, I'm really interested in this question of time limiting it to the, uh, to the time of a, a public health a declaration of a public health emergency. So assuming that there's still transmission post health emergency, and I do think at you know, some point this is going to come off and, and there might still be some transmission. I, I'm wondering if you view the current wording as a concession almost, as opposed to draft 1005 in the special session, just curious on, on whether you view that as a, that as a concession. Ms. Madam Shane. Chairman, um, Representative Gray, as a concession, I'm, I'm not certain I totally understand your question. I um, do agree with you that this is uh, emergency time limited. Um, when we first began talking about immunity legislation, it was important as we talked it through that there be some sort of sunset date to whatever kinds of immunity legislation that um, you all can passed. And so within the changes that were made during the special session, that's a, that is basically intrinsically uh, contained there by the end of the emergency. If you um, considered a different change, we still would encourage some sort of sunset date um, rather than having this go on forever, make it very specific to this either this particular emergency or a public health emergency. Follow up representative. No, thanks. Thank you though. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Ms. Shaner. Committee members, I just want to throw this out there as I remembered it and as I've thought about this issue just in my mind. Uh, and I briefly discussed this uh, before the meeting with a couple, with, with one of the attorneys who's presented today. Uh, so in the current legislation, in the current bill, you know, there's this grant of immunity. So how do we know how that usually works? This committee just reviewed a process associated with a grant of immunity in some fairly significant legislation that we passed. And I just want to put your minds there in that recent Supreme Court decision dealing with some of our previous legislation about what that process looked like that the Supreme Court created in the Stand Your Ground um, legislation that is just to keep in mind, and usually the civil attorneys who we're hearing from now don't really cross over into the criminal realm. Um, and so they're not really aware of that tool in the toolbox that our Supreme Court has just laid out in relationship to a criminal case, yes. But there are some concepts there that I think are pretty neat. Um, and this committee is aware of them as a result of just reviewing that in our last meeting and reading that LSO memo. Just, just planting that thought, I think it's an interesting legal question. Um, with that, uh, we will turn to Mr. Michael Duff. Thank you for being here, Mr. Duff. Please introduce yourself to the committee and we are excited to hear your comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Michael Duff. I'm a professor of law at the University of Wyoming College of Law. I've taught for 14 years uh, at the College of Law. I teach torts, workers' compensation and other subjects. And so I have great interest in uh, the subject matter that is under discussion. And I have to apologize starting out because um, I, you've worn me down and I'm losing my voice and my blood sugar is low. So I'm, I'm vulnerable to attack at this moment. So, uh, you know, keep that in mind. <coughs> um, so uh, I guess the first thing, the reason I wanted to testify actually, because initially I wasn't entirely clear on the purpose of the proceeding since the, uh, since the uh, provision had already been, immunity provision had already been passed. But I understand this is sort of an ongoing conversation and there will be subsequent uh, special sessions and the like. <clears throat> I would say that um, 
given how anxious everyone is right now, and of course, everyone around the country is anxious, it's uh, completely understandable to me how you would uh, be wanting to uh, provide immunity uh, protections. Uh, you know, the real purpose I have in testifying is simply to communicate that uh, the reason I can sort of understand it is because it's time limited. Uh, this is a, this is a time, and we've already had some dis, uh, questions. And Representative Gray uh, asked uh, a good question about the uh, the timing, and you know what? I'm sure there are strands of the Black Plague uh, that are still around. Um, so you know, the problem is that if you're going to limit liability, the question is how long are you going to limit it, and what is the scope of the limitation? Um, one of the key things to think about here, uh, and I think uh, Ms. Shaner already spoke to this, is uh, essentially, uh, you, you know, you have a, a whole bucket of costs that you're considering. You're considering cost to business, but you're also considering cost to customers, uh, consumers, a whole range of actors who are out and about in the uh, general economy. Uh, and one of the first things I say to my tort students is that costs never go away. They only shift. So when you uh, cut off liability in one area, what happens is those costs go to some other area. And as policymakers, I think that's something that needs to be thought about. If you have uh, folks that are sick uh, in the community or injured for that matter, uh, and they are uh, completely barred uh, from bringing a negligence claim. And, and the more I listened to this, uh, uh, I thought that uh, what Mr. Cave was arguing for was, uh, was uh, actually um, uh, a, a complete uh, uh, inability to bring a claim in the absence of gross negligence, leaving the good faith uh, requirement out of it uh, and so forth. Well, when you, when you shut down negligence to that extent, what happens to injured and sick people? And the answer is they go somewhere else. Uh, they put a strain on some other benefit system. Uh, they put a strain on uh, family members. They put a strain on uh, local churches. I mean, there's any number of systems that they impact. And as a matter of policy, that may be justifiable, especially when we're dealing with a closed uh, period of, of limited duration. Nobody knows how limited, obviously. Um, to me, this is a, 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 a fundamental question of the rule of law, uh, because uh, it's always been the case that negligence imposes costs on business. That's always been true. Um, and from the beginning of the beginnings of negligence, which by the way, go back to the uh, 16th century, uh, there have been arguments that um, imposing negligence costs on economic activity will unduly burden that economic activity. Of course, it will, it will impose costs. Uh, you will have to uh, you will have to defend cases, and anyone who imagines that simply because you uh, draft an immunity provision that lawsuits will stop, uh, do they don't really understand my students very well, uh, because law uh, cases aren't going to stop. Uh, th they may be easier to dismiss, they may not, and I and I have some points I want to make about the immunity provision itself uh, in that regard. Uh, I wanted to I wanted to say I always uh, present my class with a pithy. Uh, kind of uh, introduction to what is uh, is to come, you know, before they are crying in week 15 uh, of the course. I, I like to introduce them with this idea, uh, which is, um, could the state of Wyoming tomorrow eliminate all of tort law? And I ask, how many of you think that it could, right? And nobody thinks that it could. And I ask why? Well, because there are limiting principles, because this is a legal tradition. Uh, they don't know this part, but yet, yet uh, but this is a legal tradition that goes back five centuries. People who are harmed uh, through the wrongful conduct of another are entitled uh, to at least have their day in court. And so I'm, I'm very resistant to the idea that what we're trying to do is to keep people out of court to make it as easy as possible for a judge to dismiss a case on preliminary motions and so forth. Uh, uh, you, you know, it's something that is uh, attractive, it saves cost, but I think you have to think about the tradition of our law, the Anglo-American system of law under which we operate and have operated for centuries. Uh, 
Uh, that brings me to my next big point. And uh, you've all been uh, listening to this stuff for a while now, so I'm gonna try to move it along. But my next big point is uh, anyone who thinks that a tort immunity blanket is not extreme is simply wrong. Where you find immunity is in pockets of law for very specific purposes for very specific actors. To simply say that during a three month period, no business entity uh, is liable for negligence period is uh, drastic. And I can tell you as a scholar of tort law, it is drastic. It, and, and it's not just under conversation here, uh, as uh, people have mentioned. Uh, uh, similar kinds of provisions are uh, being enacted uh, all over the country. And I can virtually guarantee you they will all be challenged. And I even know how they'll be challenged. I could probably write the brief right now. Uh, so now how that comes out, I don't know. But that sounds like litigation to me. Uh, so if the objective is to minimize litigation, I would respectfully suggest that a way to uh, minimize uh, litigation may not be to absolutely choke off uh, negligence claims going out in the future. I think that uh, that's going to get uh, some uh, pushback. And in this regard, I wanted to distinguish tort limita limitations from the elimination of negligence, because I think they're very different. Uh, we all know about tort reform. And any of us who have read about it and thought about it know that usually what you're talking about are limitations on, for example, punitive damages, pain and suffering, uh, items that don't seem especially compensatory. You know, you're doing more than making somebody whole for their losses, all right? Uh, where tort reform uh, efforts have been upheld by state Supreme Courts have been in situations like those. We don't have any cases in which um, for a period of time, a legislature uh, attempted to limit all liability uh, short of gross uh, negligence. Uh, we, we don't have uh, efforts that broad. They're, I'm not aware of any. Um, so this is something that is coming down the pike in terms of um, in terms of uh, future uh, litigation. Uh, one of the things that I find interesting when I listen to these uh, conversations is I get the sense that people really don't know what negligence is. It's as if I could walk into a court grab a complaint from the clerk, allege a bunch of negligent stuff, and uh, my client would be mailed uh, a check. Uh, <laughs> there are a few steps uh, that come in between the filing of the complaint and a successful action. Um, with respect to the questions regarding, uh, well, um, how, how do we know what to do? Well, uh, negligence law has been consistent since about the uh, early 19th century. You need to act as a reasonably prudent person would under the same or similar circumstances. Negligence law does not require superhuman effort. You're not required to guess what COVID-19 may do next. Uh, it's simply, that's simply not what negligence law is. It's a question in which we assess the overall conduct of the defendant, right? And determine whether they acted reasonably under the circumstances. Now, does this take time and effort and money? It can. Uh, it takes time and effort and money when we're talking about auto accidents. Uh, any area of negligence law that you wanna talk about uh, carries the potential uh, for uh, litigation. Uh, you know, And uh, I respectfully suggest that nothing that you do is going to extinguish uh, litigation uh, writ large. Uh, all right, so, uh, and by the way, uh, one of the interesting things about the good faith of notion, now Mr. Cave, I think rightly points out that uh, you're, it, it's kind of a, a weak form of negligence. It's, it's almost as if the drafter thought, you know what, uh, we can't actually say that somebody acting in bad faith shouldn't be liable. I mean, we put all that stuff about gross negligence and a wanton wolf at the end, right, to make ourselves feel better. But, but actually, we, what we imagine is that somebody is uh, acting in good faith, right? Well, what does good faith really mean? Well, I, I would suggest what it means is reasonably under the circumstances. Uh, and so I actually agree uh, with uh, Mr. Cave. Now, 
just to give you a sense of how old some of the principles that we're talking about are, and I promise I'm not going to bore you uh, <laughs> with, with this uh, forever, but, uh, you know, there was an old case that we teach in torts law where uh, a guy's uh, hay ricks uh, burst into flames at the boundary of his property, and you know what happens next. They catch on fire, um, you know, they burn down the farm right next to him, and they ask him, why did you why did you do this? I mean, don't you know that if you stack hay in a certain way, you stack those ricks that there's uh, combustion and the risk of fire? And he said, yeah, but you know, I did the best I could, right? Now, nobody thought he was a bad guy. Nobody thought he was wrongful, like, you know, somebody who's going to hit you in the leg with a hard uh, implement. I mean, it's just that, look, uh, the idea is you have, uh, the community has a right to expect you to measure up to certain norms of conduct. Now, is it possible for a business owner to act negligently in this environment? I think it is. But the way the immunity is written, the idea is unless you're grossly negligent, now we can talk about what that means. Nobody knows what that means. I teach it and nobody knows what that means. All right, really, really, really negligent. So you can be negligent but just not really, really, really negligent. If you're somewhere in between negligent and really, really, really negligent, you're not subject to, uh, uh, to any kind of a, uh, a negligence action. Okay, as a matter of policy, a state can choose to do that. And as I say, I understand it in this environment. But of course, when we start talking about when will the immunity end? Should we have an end date? Should, well, I should hope so, since it contravenes about 500 years of law. I, I would hope that there would be uh, some uh, end date. Now, I just want to say a couple of things about Article 10, Section 4, and we, did, we haven't really had um, uh, much discussion. That's the constitutional provision dealing with uh, the limitation of damages. And, uh, and since there hasn't, we haven't been talking about it, I run the risk of just pouring you to uh, absolute tears. So what I'm going to do is just say a couple of quick things about it. Uh, first of all, it's very unique. Uh, it's uh, very unique for a state constitution to say, hey, legislature, you can't limit the amount of damages available to a plaintiff, right? Um, I think we should pay attention to that because uh, the drafters of that provision had something in mind. I know what they had in mind. They had in mind employers and insurance companies coming in and lowballing uh, injured workers and a law that would uh, authorize that. But, but leaving that to one side, it's there and it's very unusual. And, and, and I highly suggest to you to compare that provision to other state constitutions. It's completely unique. Uh, and now there are some distinctions made in the uh, LSO uh, draft uh, between causes of action and amounts of damages and so forth. Uh, I, I have, and I'd be happy to send to the committee, I mean, I have analysis of that, but essentially I, I'd, ask, I'd ask you to think about the following common sense question. Do you imagine that the, um, the drafters of that constitutional provision and the state uh, legislators that ratified that constitutional provision ever imagined that it would be okay to completely cut off the right to uh, a negligence action. That is not at all in the spirit of that provision. And if you think about it closely, um, that the spirit of the provision runs in exactly the opposite direction. Moreover, last thing I'm gonna say, I promise, uh, is that the, the cases cited by LSO in which the Wyoming Supreme Court uh, has said that the legislature can alter uh, tort remedies and so forth, um, none of those cases uh, emerged in the context of the legislature totally attempting to cut off any uh, right of recovery. So, for example, in the workers' comp context, right, we have a co-employee liability case. Well, the, the thing was that the co-employee was not going to get a chance to sue in tort, but you know what they had. They had a workers' comp remedy. So, so factually, it, they're completely distinct, and I'd be uh, happy to uh, provide you uh, analysis on that, but I think right now I'll just uh, shut up and take questions. Professor Duff, thank you so much. I uh, appreciate that uh, information. It, we sometimes miss the bigger picture um, when we're kind of doing these so narrowly focused topics and very helpful. We do have questions from members of the committee. 
starting with Representative Washett. Thank you, Madam Chair. Professor Doff, thank you for being here today. One of the things that really alarmed me during the special session was when we heard testimony that most of our businesses insurance policies specifically exclude coverage for infectious disease type situations. Can you describe for us uh, what happens to a business that's sued successfully uh, when they do not have insurance coverage? My fear is that it causes these businesses to close. It, cer it certainly could, uh, Representative Washington. I mean, I'm not going to contend that it, uh, that it wouldn't. Of course, and let's make clear, somebody's already made the point, but we're not talking about lawsuits involving employees. Uh, we're talking about uh, customers and that uh, class of persons. Um, uh, but I think one thing to keep in mind is what is the actual recovery for a negligence claim? So it's very natural for us to think that what we're talking about is a multi-million dollar lawsuit uh, where damages just magically accrue and can just wipe a business out. Well, typically, unless you're dealing with a situation involving punitive damages, which is something I can't imagine because that's, uh, that requires um, uh, something close to intentional conduct. Uh, so if we're talking about mere negligence, uh, the, the measure of recovery is going to be something like lost wages. It's going to be something like, uh, you know, certain kinds of compensatory damages. Now, granted, the individual could die. Somebody could die, and it could be because of the COVID-19, and that's a more expensive claim. Uh, I do think that that is uh, that is a problem. There's no question about it. I'm not I'm not suggesting that there's no such thing as tort liability in this environment. What I am suggesting is that there are reasonable ways to react to this uh, unusual hypercharged environment. And I think there are ways that are less reasonable. And so if what we're talking about is a very carefully defined closed window period of liability limitation, then I think that makes that makes sense. Now, uh, to Representative Gray's uh, question, well, what if somebody uh, catches, alleges that they've caught the illness, you know, three months after that window closes? Well, what's going to happen is that with the passage of time, it's going to become increasingly difficult to claim that the COVID-19 was caused by the interaction in a particular business. So time has a way of dealing with uh, causation issues, but there's no doubt uh, that there is the risk of liability. Representative Stith. Madam Chairman, thank you. Mr. Professor Duff, thank you. Wouldn't you agree that the idea of good faith is also an old concept in the law and that courts have not said that good faith and negligence are the same thing that and wouldn't you agree that having a safe harbor of public health director instructions or public health officer instructions uh, would be useful? The, yeah, that's my question. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think everybody's made uh, good points here about how on the one hand, it can establish a standard of care that could set a plaintiff up having an argument for a liability. But on the other hand, it provides business owners a very clear idea of what's expected to them. And so the defense in a tort case, you can imagine, is we were complying with the standard of care, and we have, uh, which, which has been formally promulgated. Everybody understands what it is, and we can show, we can show that we did what was required of us, right? That's a very powerful argument, depending on the kind of case you're looking at. So, so yes, I think it can be useful, but I'm also not going to evade the argument that yes, once you have put a standard of care out there, if the business doesn't comply with the standard of care, it provides a basis for alleging negligence. I think that's true too. Thank you, Professor. Co-Chairman Kirkbright and then Representative Pelkey. Thank you, Madam Co-Chairman. Uh, Mr. Duff, thank you for your presentation. I hear you saying that the amendment or the, the legislation that's being proposed today uh, would be classified as extreme. How do you feel about the legislation that we passed during the special session? Uh, was it extreme or did we get it about right? And what are the oh. distinctions between the two? I would have, I, if I had been involved in the debate, I would have argued against it. But as I started out saying, I, I certainly understand that given the, 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 the quick 
uh, convening of your body and the pressures that the legislature was under. Um, it, it, it's a piece of legislation that makes sense to me under the circumstances. So um, I have read uh, some uh, liability legislation that I think goes farther, frankly, than Wyoming's does. Uh, so I actually do think it was measured in certain respects. And I should also say that I applaud the, uh, the legislature uh, for enacting the uh, uh, workers' compensation presumption, because I think that's a tremendous liability limiting uh, mechanism. And not everybody understands that the more uh, employers you cover with workers' compensation, the more they are insulated from uh, tort suits. So I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Representative Pelkey. Uh, thank you. Uh, good to see you, Professor Duff. Good to see uh, you. Now, I'm not particularly comfortable with the proposed legislation, but the one thing that makes me most uncomfortable is the establishment of a clear and convincing uh, standard in in this proposed legislation. I'm just wondering, uh, from your perspective and experience, how common or uncommon that establishment of that uh, clear and convincing standard is. Well, uh, now in the in the con we're, we're in a context that we've never seen before. So so uh, so to the extent uh, that we're talking about clear and convincing in the context of a pandemic, uh, I don't uh, I, I don't know. Generally speaking, as you know, uh, Representative Pelkey, clear and convincing is a very demanding standard. Uh, for a plaintiff to meet. And effectively, uh, the effect that it will have is making um, uh, uh, actions uh, very difficult to bring. And I think everybody needs to understand that's a policy choice, right? Um, a state can, uh, uh, can have a policy if it wishes of, for, for making um, negligent suits uh, nearly impossible to break, right? And clear and convincing standards, a very demanding standard. It's articulated differently in different uh, statutes, but uh, as an evidentiary standard, uh, suffice to say, it's, it'll be very hard to meet. So, and, and so if everybody understands that and understands that what you're doing as a matter of policy is to make those claims very unlikely, it's very unlikely that they'll be successful, then, you know, you're going into it with your eyes open. Right. It's uh, it, yes, it does show up in other areas of law and where it shows up in other areas of law, uh, plaintiffs are much more likely to be successful. So that's just the reality of it. Did I answer the question? Any further questions from Professor Duff? Professor, thank you so much. Uh, following thank up you. on Chairman Kirkbride's question, you're not you're not done yet. Um, what so right now the committee is the next questions for really for the committee are we have a couple of options in front of us um one do nothing two uh have lso draft a bill based on the recommendations from um mr cave uh another option would be is to kind of uh do that and also form a working group of people to work on that draft legislation to bring to our next meeting just kind of thinking of some of those things. Um, we're, Court Chairman Kirkbride was essentially asking, should we leave it alone or should we move forward with the proposed um, work as presented by Mr. Cave? What are your thoughts there or should it be something in between? I would leave it alone, uh, but to me, even more important than leaving it alone is being very, very clear about the, um, uh, the time uh, the, the sunset provisions, uh, the duration of the uh, provision. Um, I, would, uh, I would rather have a very aggressive uh, negligent, negligence preclusion statute that, that's tightly tethered to a firm deadline uh, than to have a presumption like the one you, you now have or a uh, liability provision like the one you now have that has the potential for going on uh, forward in time. My primary um, uh, reason for wanting to testify is to sort of express in the strongest possible terms how strongly I feel uh, about the necessity for this being 
very closely connected uh, to the uh, to the pandemic. And in fact, I would be opposed to uh, extending it to healthcare emergencies generally, uh, simply because uh, you know it depends on what the emergency is. Uh, there are some kinds of healthcare emergencies that aren't going to come anywhere close to the kind of emergency that we have now. And so, uh, but but uh, so I guess that's my answer is I would leave it alone. Uh, but whatever you do, my counsel to you uh, would be to be very, very clear about timelines. Thank you, Professor. Very, very helpful. Okay, any Thank final you. questions? All right. Appreciate your time. Thanks for hanging in with us. Thank okay. you very much. Get that blood sugar back where it should go. <laughs> All right, committee, we don't have any other public comment on the topic. So discussion committee, thoughts on the bill, Representative Stith. Madam Chairman, thank you. Uh, I would make a motion to adopt or to authorize and direct LSO to prepare a bill draft that's uh, substantially in the form as the email attachment that I sent out earlier and if at the and for the benefit of the public, I just might read the paragraph uh, uh, that would get changed. It would be 35-4-114, immunity from liability, A, and it would say, during a public health emergency as defined by Wyoming Statute 35-4-115A1, any person or entity who in good faith follows the instructions of a state, city, town, or county health officer or who acts in good faith in responding to the public health emergency shall be immune from any civil action alleging that acts or omissions of the person or entity caused another to be exposed to or contract the communicable disease on which the public health emergency is based. This immunity shall not apply to acts or omissions constituting gross negligence or willful or wanton misconduct. And then the remainder of the bill draft would track the suggestion by uh, Mr. Cave. Moved by Representative Stitt, seconded by Senator Anselmi Dalton. Any discussion on the motion? Senator Anselmi Dalton? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I like that because it keeps the safe harbor immunity. Um, if you actually follow tailored guidelines, and I know that doesn't apply to everyone, but I, I still like that revision. I, I'm just throwing it out there, and it was a question whether we would do two bill drafts. I sent all of you what Utah did, which was very broad immunity. Maybe that is not something people have um, the feeling for, but I, it's just a question whether we could do two bill drafts and have people think about it. Just and maybe I'd like to see what the committee thinks of the Utah stuff I sent out. Sorry. We're on uh, Representative uh, Stith's motion for the bill draft, and we'll we'll come back to further discussion, Senator on somebody Dalton, based on your recommendation on Utah. So on Representative Stitt's motion, any further discussion? Uh, Representative Pelkey. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I urge the committee to move cautiously on this. I mean, we're making a policy decision that, as I said last time we met, we are sending a message that Wyoming is business friendly. Uh, but in concert with that, we're also sending a message that we're not citizen friendly. These are costs that are incurred as a result of someone's negligence. Uh, I think what we did this, uh, when we initially addressed this issue during the special session was appropriate, but I think that expanding it and expanding the, uh, the liability protections goes too far. So I'm going to vote no on this amendment. I'm going to vote no on or on this proposal, and I'm certainly going to vote no on the uh, proposal being advanced by uh, Mr. Cave. Uh, Representative Washett. I'd just like to say, you know, all we're voting on now is, is the bill draft. Uh, we're not voting on the, the substance of that draft. So uh, I just encourage the committee to vote in favor. I, I would say, just in light of our time limitations with this, we, want, we do want to be cautious, but um, I, I am going in list of the blue hands, so just letting you all know. Um, Representative Salazar. Thank you, Madam Chairman. 
Um, I also want to piggyback on um, uh, some comments. I, I'm going to be voting in favor of this. This is going to be uh, vetted by the full legislature. If it, if it were to go forward, uh, we're, we're here till two o'clock. Clearly it cannot be fully vetted by us. The idea though goes forward and we let the state legislature, we let both bodies then argue the, the strengths and weaknesses of this. I don't think there's any doubt that the vast majority of businesses in Wyoming are looking, are looking for this. They're looking for this help. And uh, so we are not the fiber, final arbitrator. The, both the, the full House and the full Senate will have ample time in a special session, as, as we all saw before, that this is gonna be argued. So I'm gonna be voting in favor of this to, to bring it forward and, and let it have a full hearing before the full legislature. Thank you. Representative Burlingame. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'm, I'm gonna be voting against this. I agree with my colleagues um, on both sides of this issue. I mean, I think the common agreement is that we want businesses open, we want businesses to feel supported, and we want to move forward feeling confident that our businesses um, are, are protected from frivolous lawsuits, that our businesses are um, not hampered by too much uh, regulation placed on them, something that makes it difficult for them to move forward. And we all want to balance that against individual Wyoming citizens' right to constitutional protections. So I went into this conversation with a lot of ambiguity. And what I'm looking for, you know, when I'm listening is, is there a guarantee or do we need to go further? Do we need to um, ask for a bill draft to at least begin the process of what else needs to happen? But to me, the, the, the concept that the chairwoman brought up about comparative fault and our understanding of what our statutes in their wisdom already provide for are so robust that they answer the need. And when I try to imagine or, or hear from any of our folks who've come forward, um, a situation that falls outside of that, I, I can't see any reasonable jury not using the statutes that we already have. So this one to me seems like it tips the balance too far, not because I don't support businesses and can't wait to get out there and spend money and, and be in our amazing Wyoming businesses, but because I think that those protections exist. So I'm a no vote on this. Uh, Representative Stiff, back to you circling around, seeing if hands are still up. If not, be sure to bring your hands down. Madam Chairman, thank you so much. I just want to briefly state what I think all of you already understand, which is the purpose of this particular motion and draft is that it does adopt the more expansive definition of the entities that it would apply to. I think that was a good suggestion by Mr. Kay. Uh, however, it deletes the clear and convincing standard, which I think is just goes too far and makes it too difficult on plaintiffs. Uh, and it also, uh, rather than having the blanket immunity, that Mr. Cave was advocating, <clears throat> excuse me, this keeps the safe harbor of, of public health officer instructions. So with that, I'd ask, encourage your uh, I vote. Representative Ponell. Uh, I was just gonna, thank you, Madam Chair, call for the question if uh, nobody else does anything. Uh, looks like, Bring your hands, bring your hands down. I <laughs> keep seeing them pop up. Okay, question having been called, all those in favor of uh, Representative Stitt's motion um, to direct LSO to do a bill draft based on his recommendations, which of course the public also has not seen, uh, but we will certainly let them see by the next meeting. Uh, committee, I would encourage you to to um, be mindful of these special sessions, and it is fast and loose, but. I'll uh, try to be as transparent as we possibly can. Um, so that is the motion. All those in favor, raise your hand up close to the camera. And these are all in favor of the bill draft. I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All those opposed? 
I see five. That motion has passed. Um, Representative Stith. Madam Chairman, thank you for your patience. Um, I would make a second motion, this time dealing with uh, Wyoming Statute 35-4-109. And the motion would be to authorize and direct LSO to do a bill draft that would update that statute to do three things. One, delete the reference to smallpox. Uh, second, establish a, a mens rea standard of intentionally, knowingly, or recklessly. And third, make other conforming changes. Uh, so I apologize, that's a bit vague, but that's the gist of it. Move, <clears throat> moved by Representative Stith, seconded by Representative Ponell. Or I'm sorry, Representative Washett. Sorry, <laughs> you're, you're both, I'm looking at you both. Um, discussion on that motion, Representative Pelkey? Thank you to clarify uh, a question for Representative Stith. So in essence, are you removing negligence from, from the mix by directing LSO to revise that statute in that fashion? And I'm just going to follow up. I, I, we're dealing with the criminal. Um, there is a crime to spread smallpox in the state of Wyoming. And that requires intent, as according to LSO Brian Fuller, Representative Stith has indicated concern about one portion of that paragraph in that in that crime as identified. But Representative Stith, what I was confused about and thinking about at the time was you wanted conforming amendments throughout. Um, and I think that's what Representative Pelkey is discussing. What conforming amendments exactly are you referring to in relationship to the one criminal statutory section? Madam Chairman, Representative Pelkey, thank you. The, uh, it, because it is a criminal statute, I think that there, the mens rea requirement would be appropriately intentionally, knowingly, or recklessly, and mere negligence would not be a crime because typically negligence is not a crime. By conforming amendments, what I really meant was that we have a lot of references here to conveying um, clothing, bedding, uh, things like that, that were directly applicable to smallpox, but that you know aren't necessarily applicable to uh, COVID-19, for example, or other infectious diseases. So, and again, this is meant to be a, a bill draft and exact language would need to be discussed by the committee, of course, to be hammered out and voted on. Further discussion? All those in favor of Representative Stitt's motion uh, to address the criminal statute of spreading smallpox, <laughs> please raise your hand. Raise them high, get them close to the camera. All um, eight, I count eight. All those opposed, please raise your hand. I count four, so that motion has passed. Any additional motions? Committee, I did have an idea, um, and I don't know how you feel about it, but there is a huge robust conversation when it comes to this immunity liability issue. And, and I, I trust Representative Salazar that the, the full legislature will have an opportunity to vet it in another short session, but I, I do worry that maybe we won't put our best um, work forward. I mean, I, I have a, a criticism of the bill draft we just had Representative Stith do and provided by Mr. Cave that in fact, we are not providing governmental immunity um, by listing some government entities and not others. So there's even challenges that I see in the definition. So I wonder if we shouldn't also try to do a working group maybe um, composed of some members of this committee to work with the Business Alliance, to work with the trial lawyers and maybe put together um, something really good. And since this is our first committee hearing to address this issue, we've done, I think, a great um, service of hearing public comment on this issue. Um, and so I would be, I think that would be prudent for us to do to make sure that the legislature gets the best work product and the amount of work we have to do via Zoom in that special session is limited. 
um, and that this committee is in the best position to do that. So I'd ask for that. Are there is there any interest? Representative Pelkey, thank you. Representative Burlingame, Representative Ponell, and Senator Anselmi Dalton. I, I think that's in the best interest of our businesses. I mean, I, I genuinely do. I, I say this often that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And I think we heard some of that, that in this effort to maybe move fast and do this immunity, we might in effect do the opposite result. So um, good. I, I think that the committee will work with that and work with LSO and, and come forward maybe with another bill draft based on the work that's been done um, already and see how we do there. Does anyone, Co-Chairman Kirkbride, do you think we should take a vote on that? Madam Co-Chairman, I think you've suggested a good approach that once the working committee is uh, working working group has put together something, you know there'll be a chance to vote on it. Uh, so, so I think at this point the working group is sufficient. Without All right. the All right. With that uh, committee, further discussion on the immunity liability issues. Okay, it is one o'clock. <laughs> We're clearly going to go past. Uh, the two o'clock time frame um, in order to get through our issues. We'll take a brief um, break. We have allotted 30 minutes for lunch. Um, Co-Chairman Kirkbride, you still think that that's a good idea in light of our afternoon committee? I know you probably need a break. I think that's a good idea too. Right, I think 30 minutes is a good amount of time. Okay, so we'll come back at 1.30. See you soon, committee. <laughs>